morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 440, I believe it is, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Do, 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 do. Today, recording day, is Monday, August 5th. 2024, and in many provinces across the country, it is a statutory holiday. Not all of them. I don't remember which one's off the top of my head, so I'm not going to sing all them out. <laughs> but it's actually a civic holiday in Ontario. Yes. And, uh, you know how I describe it's called the civic holiday, but it's yes, also it that means it's not statutory, which also means that a lot of companies don't pay their employees for today. Oh. Yeah. Found that out the hard way once. I went, why am I missing? But like, I don't understand. I'm missing money on my check. And they go, well, what do you mean? And I go, well, I, I, it, it's showing eight hours less than what it should be. And they go, no, that's right. I'm like, what do you mean it's right? That, 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 that statutory holiday is a civic. So they go, no, it's a civic holiday. It's not statutory. We don't have to pay for that. I'm very surprised because I thought like this. Two system. companies. Two companies I've worked for in my life have yeah, done that. That's and, that's, that surprises me because like Cesar okay. Baptiste on the 24th of June. Mm -hmm. This is our equivalent. This is the provincial one that we get. Yes. Yeah. It's not statutory in Ontario, which means a lot of companies just simply don't pay their employees today. So they can give you the option to come into work if you like. When oh. everybody else is thinking it's the long weekend and it is the long weekend, but you're just not getting paid for today by a lot of companies. Most companies are decent enough to go, you know, we'll see this as like an extra little reward for our employees who have been working hard all year. And they put money aside so that they can cover payroll for that single day. It's like one bloody day. Reward your employees and pay them to have an extra day off because we all work our asses off. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to go on a diet. I'm, I'm, I'm unemployed right now. So. I, I did not know that. You yeah, just talked to something. found that out the hard way. Oh, well, there you go. Because um, you go to pay your bills and you're like, I'm, I'm missing a few hundred dollars from my check. Uh, it looks like a whole eight-hour shift was not paid. Why is that? Oh, I'll tell you why. Uh, 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 uh. Wow. I, I really did not know that. <laughs> a lot of people don't. All right. And they find um, out the difficult way. Yeah. So, uh, wait, I've, I've got something here. It says... Uh, it's called Regatta Day in Newfoundland, Terry Fox yep. Day in Manitoba, Saskatchewan Day in Saskatchewan, British Columbia Day in BC, uh, Natal Day, I guess, I'm mm -hmm. guessing it's Natal and not Natal, uh, Day in Nova Scotia and PEI, Simcoe Day in Toronto, uh, New Brunswick Day in New Brunswick, Colonel, Colonel By Day in Ottawa, Heritage Day in Alberta, Joseph Brandt Day in Burlington, Benjamin Vaughn Day in the city of Vaughan. And I believe that that's uh, all the provinces. But uh, no, mm -hmm. there must be other provinces or territory. Isn't there at least one territory which it's a? I believe so. Special day as well, which is not listed here. But uh, yeah. Oh well, interesting. Huh. You've taught me something. I'm your host, 
the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And uh, it's a wet one here at the Beaver Lodge. Yeah. Was According it to the Weather Network, yeah, yeah. There's uh, right now it's not currently raining, but uh, the whole ground is wet. But uh, there's like over sixty percent chance of precipitation. At least when I went to bed up until seven o'clock uh, today, so it's going to be a, a wet one unless uh, the weather report has changed since I've uh, woken uh, since I've gone to bed. It hasn't hasn't started here yet. Ah, no, it, it, it's wet. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 going to rain. You can feel it, but it hasn't started yet. Mm. Mm. I'm your host. The eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver. And as you can all hear with me, as usual, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss v Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, good sir, how's your mental health doing this fine holiday Monday? Uh, it's not wonderful, but that's only because I was watching a movie last night and I fell asleep with about 20 minutes left in it on the couch. So I got up and went to bed and that was around 10 o'clock, 10, 10, 20, something like that. Cla crawled into bed, woke up at quarter to one, wide awake and laid there till about three 30 and thought, this is stupid. So I just went to the couch, turned on the TV, fell back to sleep around four and then Lola jumped on me at five 30. So I'm not yeah, not a lot of sleep and a broken night yeah yeah exactly so uh, i can guarantee you i'll be taking a nap right after we sign off today mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good morning to the kids who have joined us kit elaine good morning my dear kit argo c acres hello kit fim hello my dear lovely to see you thank you for joining us today kit saucy kit mr jim kit linda m kit pnc bio good morning to all of you tabby g hello my dear so lovely to see you this morning yes kit lane we are closing in on five thousand subscribers Woohoo! <laughs> we're still growing we're still growing that's a good thing good morning to you as well cassie uh lake uh, it says, uh, who tells us it's Terry Fox Day in Manitoba. Uh, Kit Saucy says, Natal Day for Nova Scotia is our day to celebrate the Navy. I think the Navy started in Halifax or the main port for them. So, but uh, I need Hugh to confirm. She says. Mm. Ah, so there you go. Thank you uh, for the additional info. See, our kids and cubs teach us something too. That's why we love the damn fam because they're the best damn fam in all of podcasting. They're smart, they're clever, they're fashionable, they're fierce, they're funny. And they have, well, if I do say so myself, most exceptionally good taste. Anyway. <laughs> where, where do you want to begin this morning? There's, there's a lot to cover. Um, oh, um, let's start with, there's one piece of uh, international news uh, that is kind of important um, before we get on to some uh, local stuff uh, out in Bangladesh, if uh, anybody has heard. Um, Actually, there's two pieces of big international news. Uh, the leader of Bangladesh, uh, Prime Minister, has um, resigned uh, oh, wow. after 15-year rule. Uh, there had been uh, thousands, uh, thousands of people protesting, um, and uh, that had defied a military curfew, and uh, they essentially stormed her official residence, according to uh, CTV News. Um, shortly. Um, uh, it says, shortly after local media showed the embattled leader, leader uh, her name is Sheikh Hassana, uh, Hasina, sorry, uh, boarding a military helicopter with her sister, Bangladesh's military chief general, uh, Wa Waker Uz Zaman, uh, apologies for pronunciation here, announced plans to seek the president's guidance on forming an interim government. He promised that the military would stand down and to launch an investigation into the deadly crackdowns that fueled outrage against the government and asked citizens for time to restore peace. Quote, keep faith in the military. We will investigate all the killings and punish the responsible. I have ordered that no army and police will indulge in any kind of firing. Now the student's duty is to stay calm and help us, he had. The protests began peacefully as frustrated students demanded an end to a quota system for government jobs. So this has been going on for, for a little bit now because I've been hearing it on the news, uh, but it was just protests, so I hadn't reported it because I didn't know what was going to happen. And frankly, let's be honest, right? There's not many of us in Canada that are all that familiar with Bangladesh and what's going on. So you know, I wouldn't have had much to add other than just reporting what happened, uh, but this is a big change. Um, 
so it seems that, uh, uh, like I said, there was a quota system uh, for government jobs based on, um, uh, you know, what they, uh, if you think of it at Harvard, Harvard, for example, what they call legacy students. Um, you know, so if your parents went to Harvard like this, if you were a child, you get like a leg up because you're the child of someone who went to Harvard. Uh, this was uh, people that had served uh, in the military uh, at some point, at some time. Uh, their children were had first dips on government jobs. And I'm guessing that some of the students had decided, well, okay, but it's like been quite a while now. So, you know, maybe we should restore that. Um, but they had uh, the demonstrations morphed into a challenge. Uh, and this is unprecedented in Bangladesh and an uprising against uh, Hasina and her ruling Awami League party. The government had attempted to quell the violence with force, leaving nearly 300 people dead and fueling further outrage and calls for Hasina to step down. Yeah, you know what? I don't know go governments, but you know, when people protest you, um, deciding to kill the protesters very rarely works out well for the government in the end. At least 95 people, including 14 police officers, died clashes in the capital on sun in clashes in the capital on Sunday, according to the city's leading Bengali language daily newspaper, Protom Alo. Hundreds were injured in the violence. At least 11,000 people had been arrested in recent weeks. The unrest has also resulted in the closure of schools and universities across the country, and authorities at one point imposed a shoot-on-site curfew. Wow. Yeah, I think I understand. That's. <laughs> That's the point at which the concept of, you know what, there's only one prime minister, but there are so many of us. The population of Bangladesh is 171 million. Mm -hmm. It's 171 million of us and there's one of you. You might not want to decide to shoot on sight. That might not be a wise decision. Oh boy. Over the weekend, protesters called for a, quote, non-cooperation effort urging people not to pay taxes or utility bills and not show up for work on Sunday, a working day in Bangladesh. Offices, banks, and factories opened, but commuters in Dhaka and other cities faced challenges getting to their jobs. Asina offered to talk with student leaders on Saturday, but a coordinator refused and announced a one-point demand for her resignation. One-point demand. Are we clear? <laughs> Asina repeated her pledges to investigate the deaths and punish those responsible for the violence. She said she was ready to sit down whenever the protesters want. Authorities shut off mobile internet on Sunday in an attempt to quell the unrest. While the broadband internet was cut off briefly Monday morning, it was the second internet blackout in the country after the protests turned deadly in July. On Monday, after three hours of suspension of broadband services, both broadband and mobile internet returned. Asina had said protesters who engaged, quote, in sabotage and destruction were no longer students but criminals, and she said the police should deal with them with iron hands. The 76-year-old was elected for a fourth consecutive term in January in a January vote that was boycotted by her main opponents, triggering questions over how free and fair the vote was. Thousands of opposition members were jailed in the lead-up to the polls, which the government defended as democratically held. Today, she is the longest-serving leader in the history of Bangladesh, well, no longer, I guess, a predominantly Muslim nation of over 160 million people strategically located between India and Myanmar. Oh, this is, did I say 120? No, 171. Yeah, 171. Okay. yeah. Her political opponents have previously accused her of growing increasingly autocratic and called her a threat to the country's democracy, and many now say the unrest is the result of her authoritarian streak and hunger for control at all costs. Uh, I'm guessing that the 160 million in the report is uh, probably based on the last census and the number that I have is probably like with Worldometer or something that tries to estimate what it would be today uh, at the current moment. Uh, so yeah, uh, Bangladesh, isn't that where the Joe Fresh factory collapsed? Asks Vim. Uh, I believe that that is indeed uh, the case. Uh, Vim, uh, yes, I will double check that, but I do, I do believe that because uh, Bangladesh does have a... Um, a big international reputation for being one of the nations where uh, these clothes uh, are made uh, rather cheaply. Um, so yeah, that's going on there. Um, in uh, the UK... Oh boy. Yeah. Um, for those who haven't seen, 
This tweet from Brendan Cox. The scenes in Rothram aren't a protest. They aren't even a far-right riot. They are an ongoing attempt to murder the men, women, and children inside by burning them alive. The stench of yeah. these days will hang around those who incited and justified it for the rest of their lives. And I'm going to scan down here. This is a screenshot from uh, a Holiday Inn Express in Rotherham uh, that they, they tried to burn down. They literally tried to light it on fire. Yeah. And who is at the heart of it all? Nigel Farage and Tommy Robinson. Yep, exactly. Now, here's the thing that, and this I learned this last week. Again, didn't have a chance to bring it to you. Uh, but yeah, um, last I heard, Tommy Robinson was on Canadian soil, mm -hmm. detained. I don't know when the hell it was he was released because it never made the news. No, it didn't. And he's back in uh, the UK. Yes, he was back in the UK. He went there to participate in one thing. And it seems that uh, he had a court case about seven days ago. And he left the UK on the eve of the court case. So he is literally a fugitive now from the United Kingdom. A senior judge has issued, an assent, assent, according to the BBC, a senior judge has issued an arrest warrant for far-right campaigner Stephen Yaxley Lennon, better known by his alias Tommy Robinson, after learning he has left the country on the eve of a major legal case against him. Yaxley Lennon left the UK by a Eurotunnel train, um, that would be Sunday, a week ago, night, despite having been arrested by Kent police under the counterterrorism powers. The 41-year-old had been due in court on Monday for allegedly breaching an order not to repeat lies about a Syrian refugee. Put a pin in Syrian refugee because it uh, relates to the story about... Uh, the place being burned. Oh. Mr. Justice Johnson has ordered the warrant not to be carried out, quote, until early October to give Yaxley Lennon the time to confirm he would attend the next hearing voluntarily. I do not know why they keep on giving these people chances. I understand about due process, but you know what type of person he is. His departure from the UK comes after thousands of his followers gathered in central London on Sunday, Saturday in his support. In July 2021, Syrian teenager Jamal Hijazi won $100,000 in damages in a major defamation battle against Yaxley Lennon, who had falsely accused him of being a violent thug, claims that spread across social media. A judge ordered him never to repeat the lies, but last year he began repeating his claims, including a film distributed online, which I believe was the reason for which he was back in the UK to sort of promote it. Yaxley Lennon was ordered six weeks ago to come to the High Court on Monday to answer the allegation that he had ignored the judge's order, a serious offense known as contempt of court. Uh, Adam Pater, representing the Solicitor General, told government minister who oversees contempt of court allegations, told uh, today, told Mr. Well, today, a week ago, told Mr. Justice Johnson that despite Yaxley Lennon knowing of this morning's case, he played the film again to his supporters on Saturday. The barrister said his public showing had been a flagrant and admitted breach of the court order not to repeat the false claims. On Sunday, the founder of the English Defense League went to the Channel Tunnel terminal at Folkestone where police officers stopped him under counterterrorism powers. When he allegedly refused to cooperate, he was arrested and held until 10 p.m. before being released. Why? On unconditional bail. Why? And leaving the country. Mr. Pater said, we understand he failed to cooperate with the port stop and search. Really? You didn't think that was going to happen. The guy respects nothing and no one. The guy traveled to other countries on other people's passport while a convicted felon. Did you really think he was going to show up for court if you released him on his own damn recognizance? What is wrong Why? with you people? Why? Why? <sighs> Mr. Pater said, we understand he failed to cooperate with a port stop and search. The implication is he was attempting to leave the country and therefore was not intending to attend this hearing this morning. The information that we have is that he is not within the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom. He has been spending significant time outside the UK since being served with the contempt application on 13th of June. He returned for the purpose of publishing the film and sought to immediately leave the jurisdiction. Just, just like in and out, in and out, na, 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 na. Can't catch me, can't catch me, basically. The court heard the police officers who had held Yaxley Lennon had no power to stop him leaving the UK. Mr. Justice Johnston said he was, quote, entirely satisfied that the contempt of court application should proceed in Yaxley Lennon's absence. The judge issued an arrest warrant to detain the activist if by October he has returned to the UK but continues to refuse to cooperate. That decision to delay executing the warrant was to give him an opportunity to return and explain why he had failed to attend this morning's hearing or to apply to have it set aside. If Yaxley Lennon does not return... The case will be heard in his absence after the 28th of October and could lead to a jail sentence. Now, I'm overdue if you ask me. Yeah. Now, the reason why um, 
this, uh, I'm, I'm telling you to uh, pay attention with regard uh, to the fact that I mentioned a refugee. It's because, um, well, according to the news, police in the English town of Tamworth near Birmingham, this is according to CBC, say a group of rioters targeting a hotel housing asylum seekers. They're targeting a hotel housing line asylum seekers. Authorities say the protesters are smashing windows, starting fires, and targeting police. This follows a similar attack earlier on Sunday in the northern town of Rotherham, which you showed us uh, pictures mm -hmm. of, Mr. Grizzly. There are, there's an anti-immigrant mob that threw bottles and fence posts lit a fire inside the hotel, which was quickly put out. Heated scenes also played out in the small towns of Bolton, Hull, and Weymouth. In Middle, Middlesbrough, a mob set fire to an overturned car. UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer had this to say, quote, about the violent demonstrations which have been happening for days across the country, I utterly condemn the far-right thuggery we've seen this weekend. Be no doubt those that have participated in this violence will face the full force of the law. Uh, according to Anna Cunningham, who's with the London Bureau of uh, the CBC, um, she was asked uh, by uh, the person interviewing her um, that there was, uh, says, uh, this is some strong language from the new uh, Prime Minister of the UK, what do you make of that? She said, this is really interesting. I think the fact that he has actually today called out the violence that we've been seeing over the weekend as being actions of the far right. Remember, this is a new government. It's the left Labour government. And Keir uh, Stummer has, in fact, only been the Prime Minister for about four weeks. And he's now facing his first major, ch major challenge. What we're hearing from him is words where he is not skirting around the issue. Uh, we do know that although these protests are not led or even organized by one single group, there are several elements of known far-right activists and sympathizers who appear to have gotten involved. But also what we've witnessed is the real use of social media uh, stoking these riots. Firstly, with the widespread misinformation or disinformation really about the identity of that Southport suspect, falsely claiming he was an asylum singer, seeker. So um, uh, this stems from the fact uh, that I believe uh, there was an attack on uh, three girls at a birthday party um, and uh, I guess the person uh, that did it from what I can understand here I guess uh, started a rumor that he was an asylum seeker but the person was actually born right in the UK which led to Tommy Robinson running with that and everybody say, oh my God, look, these asylum seekers killed three of our white people. Let's go get them. He's such an intolerant piece of shit. Which led to this. Uh, there are some people who have been out on the streets protesting who have said, look, we're only here to voice our concerns about immigration. It doesn't mean that we are a member of far-right groups. They are calling themselves patriots instead. But I think in terms of that view coming directly from the Prime Minister in Downing Street, he has called this out as far-right violence. Um, of course, he is vowing that all rioters will be prosecuted. Um, the last time that the UK saw rights this large was in 2011, when Starmer was the head of the Crown Prosecution Services. Uh, quote, what we can glean from how we handled those riots then and what might happen now, uh, it is interesting because given he is new to the job of Prime Minister, it hasn't been missed that he doesn't, in fact, have experience when dealing with large-scale scale disorders. Um, the... Reporter then asked, um, you mentioned the 2011 riots. They were in London, and in fact, he oversaw uh, extended quotas to process the number of prosecutions, and British ministers we know have met with members of the judiciary and police chiefs to discuss this possibility again. Uh, that possibility of triggering what's called the additional courts protocol. It wouldn't be a surprise now if, as prime minister, he does advocate under the current situation for those fast-track courts to be in place. And as you say, these are all going on if police are unable to quell these mobs in the next few days. And then she asks, what other options does the UK government have? And uh, the reporter uh, states that uh, that's a big question. And uh, there's one more extreme and rather rare measure that the British government does have, and it includes plans for armed military personnel to be deployed in support of the police. That's always a tricky one, particularly with the white supremacist group, because uh, that's the same thing here in uh, in Ottawa for the protest, right? Uh, the, not the protest, uh, the occupation. Uh, people were saying, like, why don't you send in the military? Because you don't send in the military to do policing, particularly with antagonist accelerationist groups who simply do want the video showing that the, the state is putting the military against them, and then, then they can say that they have war. So, 
that it's always a bad, bad, bad choice. Uh, but uh, she says, but the issue with that is that once again, there could be a public backlash to it because, but I think certainly at the moment with the situation as there is, uh, as it is, uh, it may be one option that could be possibly being discussed by the British government as that violence continues. Um, according to BBC, um, at least 10 police officers were injured during the demonstrations. Uh, this is from uh, August 4th, yesterday, around 8.39 p.m. At least one car was overturned and set on fire in Middleborough, which uh, we re uh, reported. Um, burning wheelie bins were pushed towards officers as the group marched through the town. Around 300 people gathered to protect a mosque in the town. Police contained around 400 protesters from opposing sides who were gathered on a Weymouth seafront. Uh, one person had been arrested there. Um, This uh, the stabbing happened in Scotland, uh, and there First Minister John Swinney had warned against, quote, the unhelpful speculation surrounding the identity of a man who allegedly stabbed a 21-year-old woman in the central Scottish city of Stirling on Saturday. Um, so this might be a, an additional uh, a stabbing that happened somewhere else because the story that I heard uh, involved three girls and not a 21-year-old woman here. Uh, she was treated in hospital for non-life-threatening injuries, and a 29-year-old man had been arrested. Um, social media rumors promoted by EDL founder Tommy Robinson suggested the attacker was Muslim. Police uh, in Scotland have said that these claims are false, and in quite an unusual move for the force have confirmed the man arrested is white and from the local area. Swinney says the incident is isolated, but his predecessor, Humya Humza Yousaf, is now urging Prime Minister Starmer to call in the army to try and quell some of the violence. Um, yeah, that is uh, bad and not getting not great. any better. And Tommy yeah. Robinson is to blame for all of it, along with the Daily Mail and Nigel Farage, because the Daily Mail has been stoking this hatred for decades. See, uh, see this because uh, see, the, and this is why I'm surprised here on this one because this one says the stabbing of a 21 year old woman in Scottish city. Uh, of uh, Sterling, and then this report that I heard this morning from the CBC uh, says they're angry over the killing of three young girls at a dance event last week. So um, I'm guessing that they're just taking any incidents of violence against someone and they're saying uh, Muslim refugees did it. Get them. Of course they are. Whatever that movement is doing. Uh, wow. Um, I think that this is uh, another quote from uh, Prime Minister Keir uh, Starmer, who uh, said, there can never be any excuse for trying to burn to death 200 of the most vulnerable. Oh no, that's um, uh, Mayor Oliver Copens, sorry, of the Northern County of South Yorkshire, uh, who uh, according to reports is still in disbelief. He says that was a concerted effort by protesters to burn down a hotel, uh, housing asylum seekers, uh, and there were about 700 people there that were smashing windows. So, I mean, it really was a mob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Uh, Tiffany Lynch from the Police Federation said the direct attack on, uh, said that during the direct attack, street furniture was being used. <laughs> I mean, they, they just grabbed anything that they could put their hands on. I'm a... Uh, yeah, it's um, this movement, and it's global, because they're all helping each other out, right? Tommy Robinson comes over here, Rebel Spons gets him out of jail, and so they're all, whatever that money that's going around that's helping how it circulates and all the buttons that they're pushing, it's international, right? It's not just local. No, and it's all part of the IDU movement, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, they've got their fingers all over this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, it's pretty ugly. And, uh, this is, like I said, this is the stochastic stuff mm -hmm. that the conservatives are promoting here. They're not saying go out and uh, hurt people yet. You know, uh, we're a little more, more, more of a multicultural country. So, um, uh, it's a little harder yeah. to make stick here. Uh, but that, that, that's what's going on. It's that's not what's good. going on. It's really bad. Uh, this, this is like the crystal knock in, in 19... 31 Germany 29 or 31 
when um, after the they had the beer hall push uh, push and then they had the crystal knock and crystal knock is what this basically is they're doing the same thing but instead of of uh, targeting jewish people they're targeting immigrants now yeah 1938 um, and over here it's the um, you know it's like uh, well, the protests um against what's going on in uh in gaza it's like they're not Canadian citizens, send them back. That's where it starts, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't start with gas chambers. It starts yeah. there and works its way up. Send them back, don't let them in, and um, you know, and then it's, oh, well, you know, they're brown, so they must not be Canadian citizens, send them back. So go, go back to where you come from, but I was born here. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, you don't look like one of us. They don't care. And then it escalates from there and there. So we're at about level one, right now mm -hmm. but uh that that's that's where they want to go that's where this bunch wants to go that's where they want to take us because they didn't create the barbaric they didn't propose the barbaric cultural practices snitch line because they were saying welcome refugees hey people who are not white we need a special 911 just for you right um so yeah that undercurrent is here too that's uh that's where they would like uh, to stoke our anger to become like this and uh unfortunately we have to show that we're better than that well unfortunately i'd like to say we're better than that but we're not uh we have members of parliament who are yeah uh, the the only member one of the let me let me rephrase that one of the few members of parliament that i had a scintilla of respect for who i thought was progressive and has said progressive things in the past but she was really acting oddly this past weekend and that's uh mrg michelle mm -hmm. rempel garner yeah candidate or the the member of oak liberta yep Michelle Rempel Garner saw what happened to Alain Reyes, saw what happened to Karen Vecchio, and I guess she decided that after all the years that she's in Parliament, that's still not enough that she should move on to another part of her career, because she too didn't support PP. So I guess she has decided that she's going to fall in line. It certainly seems that way. For those of you who are unaware, what she did this past weekend was take picture, uh, take photographs of uh, the Prime Minister dressed up on Halloween. Uh, when he was in India, when he was at a cultural fest in, I think it was Markham, and he's dancing. And then, of course, you know, when he was openly weeping about the death of Gord Downey, his friend, somebody that millions of Canadians cried about because we all felt attached to Gord Downey, those of us who wept. And she's saying, live by the weird, die by the weird, weirdo. So let me see if I get this correct, Michelle. You're making fun of the prime minister who is weeping at the death of a friend of his. Lady, have you no empathy, no compassion, no decency? You have lost the plot completely. She, whether she has all, any of those or not, doesn't matter. She wants the nomination. She doesn't want to be run out. Yeah. She, she sees it. She sees the purge happening. Mm -hmm. She's just fighting to keep her job. So disappointing. She has her moments when she shows that she can be progressive. Um, yeah, yeah, but no, 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 no. Don't, we, like, we can't have that. No. It's the PP Purity Party now. Yes. Yeah, it's the basically. PP Purity Party now. And she saw. She saw how them got theirs. So, you know, kids and cubs, when I keep on saying, don't vote for assholes, weirdo assholes, do stuff like take a picture of someone who's weeping because someone who's a national treasure and was yeah. a close personal friend has passed away and then tries to reframe that as a negative in order to diminish someone. Perhaps don't vote for people who mock people who mourn. 
that might be a good baseline. Don't vote for assholes. Don't vote for assholes. Don't vote for for those who who would literally. So, and and here here's the toxicity of that. So we're trying to tell men it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to express feelings and have feelings and let us know when you're hurting. And very clearly, the prime minister was hurting because he lost a friend, someone he cared about very deeply. And they're making fun of him for showing emotion. So the toxicity of that, Ms. Garner, is off the charts. You are making fun of a man who is hurting. You are making fun of a man because he's weeping over the death of a friend, which then sends the message that men have to be quiet and stoic and cannot feel. You realize the mental health ramifications from your actions, Ms. Garner? What is wrong with you, lady? You, you need to go to a therapist right now and examine what you did this past weekend. Because if you're only doing this to save your hide and keep your job, you are not worth it. Your you're job not is worthy not worthy of the it. job. You're not worthy of it either. You're throwing any shred of decency you had in the toilet to score a point for your dear exalted leader, who, as we all know, is a fucking narcissist. Oh, I, I, I got to calm down. I'm, I'm on a roll right now, dude. I am pissed. Yeah, just like that committee where the three mean girls of the Conservative Party set it up in order to exploit the misery and the pain and the tragedy of survivors of domestic abuse. Right? Like, what is it, the problem with these people? And I just to, to, and just, you know, kids and cubs, uh, we talked about last week, Tracy Foran, if you'll put this up, Mr. Grizzly, to remind the kids and cubs, when we're talking about um, the lack of empathy, remember this? Mm -hmm. Maggie May, um, I was providing palliative care to my late husband during COVID. I couldn't access palliative care from healthcare worker from healthcare workers because we were on shutdown. I took care of him, gave him his morphine, spoke to our doctor each day, sent the doc an Excel graph of when he needed morphine. And Tracy Foran, and this was not even addressed to Tracy Foran. She just jumped no. into the commentary and said, "Oh, please do tell me how you were a better than me. I beg to be enlightened." The lack of empathy. The lack of empathy stunting on people the lack of compassion the lack of basic humanity yep. this is stunting on people i'm sharing something because oh you think you're better than me somebody's mourning someone oh my god look at this weirdo crying in public stunting on people for points for clicks to perform for an audience of one not caring who you hurt she she, she sold her soul that's it. She is available to the highest bidder, it would seem, because she's trying to keep her job because she doesn't care about anything else, obviously. Nope. I thought she was one of the few progressives in the party. Michael Chong has disappointed us. Scott Aitchison has disappointed us. Yep. She has disappointed us once again. So here we are. So um, this was the first one. Mm -hmm. It's with... Um, Weird. A thread, categories, performative nonsense during a cost of living crisis. Um, it's Halloween. It's Halloween. Probably not. And I, I would guess since uh, <laughs> Catherine McKenna's in the picture, mm -hmm. it was before the cost of living crisis started because I believe she quit politics before this. Yes. Kind of stuff. She did. And then, um, yeah, Live by the weird, die by the weird, weirdo. I just, I just don't get it. And then, oh, yeah, and then uh, uh, of course, the, the blackface. Yeah. Just got to throw in some blackface, right? Just a little casual racism because uh, no, there, there's no way that there are black people in Canada like us who are, haven't seen this photo like for mm -hmm. the uh, one millionth time now. They keep regurgitating the hands, that. Regurgitating being the key word here. Mm -hmm. Constantly. 
and then and then uh, Robin Urbach had a great uh, article uh, with uh, regard to that uh, that uh, I, I think I should read in because uh, Robin Urbach she's hit or miss mm -hmm. yeah, she but when she's on she's on um, Hillary Clinton uh, sorry, I'm going to have to bring this onto this screen actually because yeah. uh, it's uh, written a little small for me. Have to blow it up. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, Hillary Clinton tried all sorts of acrimonious attacks against Donald Trump when the two were vying for the White House back in 2016. Mr. Trump was a bad role model for children, she implied in one ad. He raised the specter of nuclear war, she warned in another. He said disgusting things about women, insulting things about veterans, racist things about black people, and he would destroy American democracy. They were all variations on the theme, one that the U.S. President Joe Biden's team would res resuscitate eight years later. Mr. Trump was a bad person, and his leadership posed an existential threat to America. The message didn't work for Ms. Clinton through, though of course there were other factors at play during that election campaign. But efforts to revive it again early in Mr. Biden's campaign came off as even more flaccid. For one, the messenger couldn't sort the order of his words properly enough to tell people what they should be afraid of, but it also didn't carry with it the same fear of the unknown that it had in 2016. American democracy lived through a Trump presidency and it survived, worse for wear, but intact. There is a legitimate case to be made that a second Trump presidential term will be catastrophically worse, but convincing people of that, which requires they lend the messenger a certain degree of attention, patience, and consideration, is a tough thing to do. That's one of the reasons why the Democrats' new line of attack against Mr. Trump and his political cavalry is so effective. Everyone knows innately what weird looks and sounds like. It's the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, saying that he and his son monitor each other's porn usage. Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. <laughs> that's Particularly since weird. his son wasn't even 18, I believe, Ugh. at the time. It's like, really? Does he, you're assuming that? Anyway. You seem uh, weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, the message didn't work for Miss. Sorry. Uh, it's really Giuliani, then attorney to Mr. Trump, holding a news conference about the 2020 election fraud at a place called Four Seasons Total Landscaping instead of the Four Seasons Hotel. Yeah, that was weird. Between a crematorium and a dildo shop. Mm -hmm. Or between a cock and a charred place. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, instead of the... It's Montana Republican Representative Matt Rosendale trying to roll back funding for in vitro fertilization because he sees it as morally wrong. It's Mr. Trump's pick for Vice President J.D. Vance joking about how Democrats would say drinking a Diet Mountain Dew is racist and repeatedly uh, taunting or ranting about sociopathic childless cat ladies. Mr. Vance is the catalyst the Democrats needed to land their message. Mr. Trump has always been a deeply bizarre figure to the point that most of us have become inured to his destructive eccentricities, but he is an authentic type of odd that he seems to come, come across as genuine. Mr. Vance, by comparison, is a clear phony who flipped his views on Trumpism 180 degrees when he ran for the Ohio Senate. He has an arrogance that appears to compensate for a deep insecurity, which he deals with by telling a lot of lame jokes to try to impress his new friends. He's uncomfortable to watch, awkward and insincere, a fresh-faced weirdo who reminds us that, hey, the rest of these guys are pretty weird too. The Republicans don't own weird, of course. They have tried to flip the script on Democrats, pointing out, for example, how they will specify which pronouns they use upon introduction. The tactic might have worked if Republicans had pushed the weird message first, but the responding defensive and clearly feeling wounded weird it seems is working it's like yeah uh, call me a racist call me a deplorable come like us i'm fine I'm like, but call me weird <laughs> i've got big feelings the reason why this line of attack is so effective against this crop of republicans is not simply because it's true delegates at the republican national convention wore fake ear bandages in tribute to their leader after all and easy to understand but because it's diminishing the Clinton and Biden messages were unintentionally ally positive. They implored Americans to fear Mr. Trump, a process that implicitly gave him some degree of credibility and power. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me, to fear someone is to give them, oh, there you go, to fear someone is to give them power over you, which is exactly the type of situation in which Mr. Trump thrives. To call him weird, however, does the opposite. I hate it when people laugh at me. I hate it. I hate it. Talk about it's belittling. Yes. It's belittling 
and deprecating, and not in the directly disparaging way that Ms. Clinton did by calling Mr. Trump's supporters deplorables, but by making them into a little joke. That air of mirth robs Republicans of the opportunity to turn it into a rallying cry as they did with deplorables, and instead puts them on the defensive, trying to insist that no, the other guys are the ones who are the weirdos. For the Democrats, whose campaign got a clear boost of energy, enthusiasm, and positivity when Kamala, Kamala Harris replaced Mr. Biden on the ticket, the message has become an empowering one. We're not scared of you. Just a bit weirded out. And it's left Republicans fuming, aghast, that the people in Whoville are still singing despite all their efforts. When the Democrats were scared of them, Republicans retained a certain power, but now that they're laughing at them, well, they've become a joke. The problem with, uh, cons and now conservatives in Canada, well, they saw the weird thing. And they see, like, if you type Polyev is, the hashtag fills itself up. Polyev is weird. Conservatives are weird. CPC, so weird. Um, the wacko party, wacko conservatives, right? All that kind of stuff. So they're trying to hit it off at the past before it sticks too hard. So they're coming out and trying to, here's the Prime Minister weird. The problem is, is that when, you, when you're the first to call people weird, they go, we're not weird. You're the weird ones. Well, they do it in ways that make them look weirder. Mocking someone who cries because somebody died, that's objectively weird. That's not a, it's not a good counter. You look weird doing it. Circulating a black voice photo? You look weird. Yes. Telling people, oh, you cared for your husband. I guess you think you're better than me. Weird. If you have an interview with a journalist and you say, like, you're the leader of the opposition and, uh, they ask you about Diagonalon. Diagonalon, what's this? What's this? I don't know what this is. When Trump was at the National Association of Black Journalists, they asked him about DEI. DEI, what's DEI? Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah, but what is it? What is it? Tell me what it is. Tell me what it is. What is it? Give me a definition. What is it? Same thing he did on the debate, right? Definition, definition. And then they said, well, the Proud Boys. Oh, Proud Boys. Stand back and stand by. But he pretended he didn't know what it was. They know what it is. They know what it is. And that leads us to the bit of weirdness uh, from Pierre Polyev. Because, um, well, he was in Sudbury, I believe, or at least in northern Ontario. He's been doing a tour there. And, um, well, he yeah. gave an interview uh, to a local newspaper. Uh, said Barry, that's not uh, an interview. <laughs> no, no, I know that, but he gave one to uh, Sudbury.com. And then again, in that interview, he did the thing that uh, PP usually does with a small interview. Um, he was asked again about, you know, extremism and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, well, you know, he did the thing that he does all the time. What extremist? When, when did I say that? Show yeah. me. I mean, I guess, and again, journalists, come on, man. He has been doing this for over a year and a half now. If you're going to go and if you get a media opportunity with him and you're going to ask him the question about him supporting that, you need, you know what he does. So come with a date that he did it. Come with a time. Come with a phone loaded with video clips. Show him. Mm -hmm. On this particular date, you said, ask him the question. Don't ask him. A lot of people say that like this. Well, who says that? What that? Just say, uh, sit there and ask him. It's like, what do you think about Diagonal? Mm -hmm. Don't ask he a said, question that has like, that, that, that lasts an hour. Well, just it, ask it, him a honest, question. I don't know what that is. Yeah. That's yeah. a, that's a, that's a lie. He knows exactly what it is because oh, yeah. they threatened to, um, do bad things to his wife. He called them out the next day, and the leader of Diagonal, Jeremy McKenzie, was arrested soon after. Yes. So a man who 22 months ago had one moment after a few days, because people who at first he tried to keep it quiet, 
of saying, hey, don't say that about my wife, and then called the RCP and said, look into this. 22 months later, cannot remember. The people who joked aloud wasn't a joke. That his wife, possibly, should be raped. And my, wouldn't that be fun and entertaining? We're going to have to cut that out. Hmm? We're going to have to cut that segment out. YouTube will nail us for it. You can't say that word on YouTube anymore. Raped. Yes. People lose their shit when you say it. You have to say S-A. I'm not, I'm not joking. People lose their minds. I know. I know. I know. That's what they <laughs> joked about. Yes, that's what they joked about. We're just reporting on a fact. It was not a joke. No. no. They meant it. A man who cannot remember 22 months later people mm. who joked about violating his wife, sexually assaulting his wife against her will is weird. Yeah. You don't remember? It's that? super weird. Crazy weird. So, according to this interview, mm. PM an extremist, according to Pierre Pellier. This is from uh, Jenny Lamotte from Sudbury.com. Justin Trudeau, according to the federal conservative leader, Pierre Polyev, quote, is a, quote, is an, quote, extremist and someone who has, quote, dressed up in racist costumes so many times he can't remember them all. Polyev spent much of his time during an August 2nd interview with Sudbury.com talking about his political opponent rather than what he's going to do for you mm -hmm. or to you. <clears throat> After speaking for close to 10 minutes in the hot sun as 50 supporters gathered at Manitoulin Transport and Lively, Polyev repeated several slogans that are now standard in his campaign and merchandise sold on his website. For rising costs, work doesn't pay, you make it, Trudeau takes it. Polyev's promotion of trade schools over universities is boots, not suits. And he said of hunting rifle bands, I want to protect Canadians from criminals. Trudeau wants to protect turkeys from hunters. He also offered jail, not bail in reference to his tough on crime initiatives. At the event, Sudbury.com was given five minutes to speak with Polyev, as were uh, other local media outlets. We began, began by asking him about the numerous publications that have spoken of Polyev's interaction with groups seen as supporting extremist right-wing views. Looking to find out what those critics were getting wrong, we were able to say, those who are not supporting you accuse you of flirting with the extreme right before Polyev interrupted. So the question was going to be, those who are not supporting you accuse you of flirting with the extreme right. What are your critics getting wrong? But he didn't let them get there. He just saw extreme right wing and boom. What do you mean? Before Polyev interrupted to ask, what do you mean? When Sudbury.com spoke of his interactions with groups that include Diagonon, which was recently in Sudbury, he asked, what is that? I don't know what that is. With, we explained, it's a group labeled by the RCP, OPP, and Canadian government as extremists. Polyev said, this is an example of gaslighting by NDP liberal extremists who are trying to convince the people that they're wrong. Justin Trudeau, Mr. Blackface, who's wrapped up in racist costumes so many times he can't remember them all, would like to tell single mom that she's racist because she can't and doesn't want to pay his carbon tax. They want to call him the trucker racist because he can't afford a home and that he's not supporting them. Said. What? This man is unhinged. That's a weird interaction. Very. That's weird. Sudbury.com told him that he wasn't quite answering the question. He responded, I know what you're speaking of. Well, this is what I'm speaking of. Weird. This man because should not be anywhere near the reins of power. Normally a conversation goes, I say something, you take into account what I say, and then you give me something back. Not, I say something, and it's like, yeah. It's like, Mr. Polyev, how's the weather today? I like egg. He's a, he's a. That's a, weird. A smug smarmy narcissist mr anti-intellectualist mr polyev <sighs> what's your tax policy just a trudeau wears black bags yeah that's weird it's not a policy weird weird so following his uh following his hold on hold on, hold on. we're not we're not done yet <laughs> with this one but right. he said he wanted to address extremism Quote, I'm addressing the extremism we have in Canada, and that extremism is a prime minister who says he admires the basic Chinese communist dictatorship, who says he admires Fidel Castro, who's passing censorship laws that Margaret Atwood have. You heard of her? He says that it's creeping totalitarianism. That's Margaret Atwood. So what? She's an extremist? Put the reporter on the back foot. Start to question them. Turn the tables, as Pierre always does. Because he then asked, out of curiosity, if our report was a fan of the author. We declined to answer as it was not relevant and we had limited time. 
<laughs> he said, obviously, obviously the fact that we do have a big problem with extremism in this country and it's the prime minister, he's an extremist. While he's delivering, uh, providing aid and comfort to actual domestic terrorists who, yeah, you know, tried to hold up the city. Valiev said the prime minister wants to decarnize crack and cocaine and he wants to pay for it given our tax-funded opioids, giving out tax-funded opioids that are killing our kids. He wants to ban automobiles that people need to get where they're going. He did not provide specifics or reference policies to what None of what, what he from. said is true. Not a no, word none of, of that true. is true. Nope. Continuing the original question, Sudbury.com asked about his critics who say he attacks segments of the 2SLGBTQ population. And again, he interrupted asking for specific dates, times, and places he made comments. Sudbury.com said, well, it was well-documented media reports. Valyev says, where? Moving on, Sudbury.com asked about polls on both sides of the border, which indicate many are looking for more of an anti-politician, one that's not entrenched in government. We asked Paul Valdiev, as a career politician who had been playing the game, why should people believe he is different? He asked, sorry, what game have I played? Sudbury.com responds, the game of politics, as it were. He brought up the value of experience when it comes to challenges. You're having a heart attack and you need a heart surgery. You hire somebody who has been a heart surgeon and has successfully operated on patients. You wouldn't say, well, geez, this heart surgeon has never been an accountant. He's never been a truck driver or mechanic. Valiev said, if you want somebody who can deliver affordable homes, so you hire the guy who was the housing minister when rent was $950 a year and when housing was a new, when housing, a new house could be bought on average for four hundred fifty grand a year. Okay, he was housing minister for not even nine months. And he didn't do a homes. damn thing. Built six homes. Six. All he did six. was over. All he did, did was oversee the cut policies. That's it. He wasn't there long enough to take credit. He wasn't long enough, not long enough there to take blame either. Because he just wasn't there long enough to do anything. And housing was, well, as the article goes, like this is good. Though Singh and Trudeau also referred to Polyev as a housing minister, technically speaking, Polyev never held that specific title. Correct. For a nine-month period in 2015, during the final year of Stephen Harper's government, he was the Minister of Employment and Social Development, wherein he assumed responsibility for the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. That's it. And uh, <laughs> ERDC, like that's the cradle-to-grave department. Your social insurance number? Mm -hmm. OAS, GIS, Canada Student Loans. Trust me, he had a lot going on. It's like this housing, it's not like the housing minister now. Though housing is the only thing he does. It right. was one among seventy things. Yeah. Well, he didn't have time to do. It. I need the media to start calling, taking him to task when he says the Trudeau government's going to supply crack cocaine to people. No, sir, that's not true. The Trudeau government isn't supplying drugs to anybody. No that is done at a municipal level yeah. by the municipality in the safe yeah. injection sites. You can't say you're canceling federal tax dollars that go to these sites because they don't get federal tax dollars. Stop lying to people. Right. So here you got Pierre, the anti-expert guy who is saying, well, but I'm an expert in governance. I've been but there for 20 years, yeah, but, but, but now we need an expert. When it's convenient, he wants one. When it is, I guess convenient. his twenty years in government makes him an expert. No. If you wanted, if you wanted someone who could bring low inflation, you'd hire somebody who, in the past, was part of a government that delivered extremely low inflation. Up until the pandemic, uh, the Trudeau government actually delivered lower inflation than Harper. That's actually, correct. we talked about this about this on the show before. Oh, and, and, been and, for a while. and the middle class received tax cuts right across the board. He keeps saying taxes are up on the middle class. No, that's not true. No, that's not true. For the working, the poor, the working poor, and the middle class, our tax cuts have gone across the board. And actually, truth be told, for high income earners, they also received a bit of a cut too. Up to two hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars, you're only paying twenty-nine percent. After that, you're paying thirty-three, which is yeah. the highest tax bracket in the country. Yes. Polyev continued, so if you want somebody to do something, you hire someone who's done it, and I have. No, he hasn't. No, he's done nothing. In 10 years of government, he was a minister about two and a half. Yeah. Because he didn't rate. He didn't rate. I guess, and one of the ERDC was a big government department that he was mm -hmm. in for nine months. The other one he was at was Democratic Reform, one that was created for him to give some legitimacy to the Fair Elections Act that he passed, the only pass of a piece of legislation he's ever passed in 20 years, and it got gutted by the Supreme Court, and pretty much all the other provisions have been overturned since. 
He has zero legislative accomplishments to speak for. He was a minister for two and a half years, only nine months in a department, in a portfolio that actually is relevant in any way to the lives of Canadians. He has no experience. None. The prime minister has been prime minister for, according to Pierre, nine years already. So if you really did want the expert like this, then take the guy that's been doing it for the last nine years. Not a guy that nobody was able to trust with a serious portfolio for more than nine months in 10 years of government. He's never done anything. He has zero accomplishments. None. Nothing. And people want to hand the reins of power over to this man who's been there that long and has done nothing. Yes. Subray.com asked if that meant experience was more important than new ideas and a fresh new face in choosing the next prime minister. I don't know if you can even look at it either way, but compared to the current government, I am a fresh new face because they've been around for nine years. You've been around for 20. (sighs) Polyev said today, it's impossible for a young person to own a home, blah, 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 goes into a whole bunch of stuff, what he's going to do with housing, all that kind of stuff. And then after the interview, Polyev asked Sudbury.com about recording. Sorry. Sorry. After the oh, interview, yeah, playing in the background there. yeah, I know. After the interview, Polyev asked Sudbury.com about the recording we had made. I hope you'll play that in full without any edits, he said. He was told it was for accurate note-taking purposes. Sudbury.com referred to the two cameras and aides watching, telling the conservative leader that his team had recorded it in full. Mm-hmm. Yes, we'll make sure that it's covered the right way. What the hell does that mean? Oh, I it know means- what it means. We're going to paint me into a good-looking picture. We'll make clips out of this so I look great. So, Pierre doing the what? Who me? Tell me exactly when. Show me the literal words. Yeah. Weird. Right? He pretends that he doesn't know what diagonal is. When he actually, you know, he's still courting them. them. He's still courting them. Well, and he's he's been briefed. He's been briefed on them. Mm-hmm. In the House of Commons, yes. if you, gets, you know, uh, yeah. if you don't know what it is, maybe you should get your security clearance. It might come in yeah, handy to that protect your own handy. damn family. So, uh, yeah, he's. They joke about sexually assaulting his wife. Mm-hmm. Twenty-two months later, he pretends that he doesn't know them, and he's still courting them. Yeah, but he calls Singh a sellout. That is scum. weird. It is weird. Yes, and this denial. Mm-hmm. Let's put it in a context of, I don't know what diagonal on is. The group of people who, again, muse aloud about violating or sexually assaulting my wife happens days after mm-hmm. the trio of CPC mean girls exploited survivors of domestic violence for memes. I don't know about you, but in my honest opinion, a man who refuses to stand up for his wife sure the fuck isn't going to stand up for you. Nope. Or Canada. Nope. Or give you freedom. Nope. Because like, if I was like Anita, I'd be at a home going like, what the fuck, dude? Gee, I think I'm starting to understand what Melania is going through. Yeah. <sighs> then... I'm asking you a question. Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm aware that you're answering me a question about one thing, but I'm here to give you my monologue. So F you. Basically is what he said. That is weird. He says, I'm addressing the extremism we have in Canada, but doesn't know what diagonal is. Let that inconsistency seek in. Weird. People need to see this man for who and what he is. Speaking of selling out to extremists, though that Father Marker Pat King keeps on violating his bail conditions, Pierre has never once said jail, not bail, as it pertains to him specifically. Of course not. Well, guess that oh, a policy doesn't apply to friends. No, 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 no. Just, just the people he doesn't like. Usually the ones that um, have a darker complexion, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. That's so just then, me. Mm-hmm. Then just unable me. to keep the PM's name out of his mouth, he goes through all the, all the greatest hits. Right? China wants to get your kids hot cut on crack, hot up, never presents proof, and he does all of this in five minutes. Mm-hmm. Wow, kind of busy. That's kind of weird. Then another weirdo moment. 
guy who encrusts himself in the House of Commons for 20 years, claims that he's a fresh face. Weird. And for his dismount, Jack Polyev gets really effing weird, not to mention paranoid, because it seems he was painfully aware that this interview did not go well for him, because why else would you need to threaten to release a counter-programming version of the interview that will frame it in the right way? Why would you need that? So yeah, let's say he didn't quite stick that landing. Well, and, and after Sudbury, he went on to Kirkland Lake, where he yes. had another rally. And, and let me just put this on the screen for you. I'm going to show you some stuff and read it to you. So from Luc Lebrun, hundreds of accounts claiming to be lo located in the United States, France, England, Russia, etc., say they are still buzzing after attending Pierre Polyev's recent rally in Kirkland Lake, Ontario. Ooh. So this is Belle. Uh, she has stuff written in, I don't know if that's Italian or Spanish. And uh, she lives in Bertin, France. She's following 55, has zero followers, and says, just got back from Pierre Polyev's rally in Kirkland Lake, and I'm still buzzing from the energy. As a northerner, it's refreshing to see a leader who actually listens to our concerns and prioritizes our needs. Oh, thanks, Belle. Oh, and look at Faye from New Yat, England six followers just got back from pierre polyev's rally in kirkland lake and i'm still it's a cut and paste as a northern ontarian you, you live in england here's somebody in uh, the province of samara russia just watch pierre polyev's rally in kirkland lake and i'm still buzzing from the energy as a northern ontarian it's i'm sorry what oh look at this a boy mom with five followers in monroe new york just got back from Pierre Polyev's rally in Kirkland Lake. As a Northern Ontario... Do you see a pattern here? Well, as it turns out, there is a pattern. And all of these tweets are from individuals that do not live in this country. But they all went to Pierre Polyev's rally. Some of them even bought winter jackets because it was so cold. Do, 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 I braved the cold. Do, do, look at this. This this is a bot army. This is page six of these screen caps. Six pages of them. Oh, look, there's seven. Apparently the rally in Kirkland Lake was very electric. Said these 50 people in these screen caps who all have zero to five followers say they're from northern Ontario, but list a different location in, in their bio. This is page seven. You may want to look at this CSIS Canada RCMP police. Page eight. This is not normal, folks. Now, I want to address something that Cassie said earlier in, in the comments, because it, 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 it pertains to this. She said, why are you highlighting what Michelle Rumpelgarner said and giving it credibility? We're not giving it credibility. No. Because, you know, most of Canada is not on Twitter. You are correct. Most of Canada is not on Twitter. We're not giving it credibility. We are trying to show those of you who watch and listen to this program who aren't on Twitter, or X if you want to call it that, what a member of parliament does on social media. When you're not watching. You need to know how these people behave when you're not looking so that you can make an informed decision. We're not trying to platform her or give her credibility. We're giving you the information and the facts so you can make an informed decision when you go to cast your ballot. And this, eight pages this is how 500 talk. people who do not live in this country were yeah. raving about the rally they went to in Kirkland Lake as Northern Ontarians. They don't live there. They don't live in the country. This is not normal. You need to know what this party will do to get your vote. And it's lie to your face every chance they get because all they seek is power and control so they can give tax cuts to their wealthy friends, cut taxes for us by, you know, removing social programs we desperately need. He'll, he'll end pharmacare, dental care, $10 a day daycare, the child poverty tax credit. Why? Because he said he will do the exact opposite of everything the Liberal government has delivered to us. 
he will do the exact opposite. He says, matter of fact, in the most recent budget, they voted no on every single line item. Every one. Every single one. These people do not care about you. This man is a narcissist, power-hungry freak who at the age of 18, when graduating from high school, said in his yearbook, quote, what is truly horrific is the existing welfare state. And if you're an 18-year-old who says that, you're weird. You're weird. It was weird then. It, like, no there's no compassion. No 18-year-old is worried about the welfare state. No five-year-old wants to defund the CBC. Exactly. They don't even know what that means. So when you see little kids at a protest with a little card that says defund the CBC, that kid didn't think of that on their own. So what he is doing with all of this is he's trying to, how I label it, manufacture inevitability. That's the only reason you do this. And you only do this if you're not... This is not the move of someone who feels that they're confident that they're going to win. When you have to manufacture and create all of this support. Yes. He was in a rally up in northern uh, Ontario claiming, we got 400 people. Douglas Judson, the lawyer who we had on this show around mm -hmm. Christmas, said, uh, the room only holds 200. Okay. And then we had 500 people praising him, uh, 500 people that do not live in this country. This is a good one from Rusty Idols at uh, Cliff 4, Cliff 4, 1, 8, 1, 7, 5, 7, 5, 3. What if Pierre Polyev's poll results, results are as authentic as his online supporters? And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the room holds what 200. We had 400 people. And then you've got 500 people, again, who don't live in the country, who claim they were... A, at the rally, B, Northern Ontarians. Yeah. And here's a, a kit made a comment in the chat, I don't remember who, but uh, asking, um, if you look at these, Lita, Dwana, Lila, Paulina, Kyla, Vanya, Georgiana, Henriette, Bernetta, Dwana, Kamala, Carla, Yes Yesenia, Kelsa, Vicky, Ileana, Brianna, Madeline, Lori, Eula, Faye, Ramona. Oh, there's a Timothy. Gianna, Ermelinda, Tammy, Dory. Gee, do you think that uh, maybe the woman against Polyev thing is a... Uh... All these women. Mm-hmm. There's one from New Mexico. Just got back for Piaz Polly in, in, in Kirkland Lake. Wow, you made a 31-hour trip. I looked it up. And that's 31 driving straight through. Because we you know got, you didn't you, fly there. Because you got to fly there. And I'm, I'm guessing that there are not lots of... I, I, I don't know how you go to Pierre's rally in Kirkland one night and just get back that very night or the next morning. It's not, not possible. You got a flight, you, you got a couple of flight connections from Kirkland Lake to New Mexico. It's not like Air Canada or US Air has like a direct flight. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to Kirkland Lake. I don't think Kirkland Lake has an airport, do they? Oh, they must, actually. They must, because they're quite far north. I mean, just... Weird. Super, super weird. And um, election interference, anyone? Mm. Might be foreign, might be domestic. Who knows what these bot farms? Who's paying for it? But somebody paid for this. So Kirkland Lake, because I've never been to Kirkland Lake, but I've been to Timmins and, and Iroquois Falls because I used to have family in Iroquois Falls. Kirkland I've been Lake, up to like Sturgeon, Sturgeon and stuff. Sturgeon. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's quite far north. It's uh, well, it's almost parallel to Rouen, Rouen, Noranda in, in oh Quebec. That's up right, there. Yeah, 
that yeah well it's like i said it's south of timmins southeast of timmins Right. Jeez. Oh man, it's, it's unbelievable. Right, I, I, six I don't and a half hours I, for me to drive there. If I wanted to drive there right now, according to Google, it would take six and a half hours. There's three routes I can take. One is eight hours and twenty minutes. The shortest is five hundred ninety-nine kilometers, six and a half hours, and uh, actually, and and one that's fourteen kilometers longer, six. Seven hours actually <laughs> for fourteen more kilometers, but that goes oh, through man. Quebec. So uh, yeah, Kirkland Lake. It's 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 far. Six hundred k from here, basically. I do not have words. I just do not have words because this is just why, why do if you are that inevitable, and if you are you're so obviously the right choice. Why do you need to do this? Why do you need to do this? It's just weird. Yeah. Weird. And I saw somebody had circulated. I wish I could find it. What it is. Oh, yeah, there it goes. There it is. Uh, these uh, bot firearms look like. Because if you've never seen one. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, but. For those who haven't, you might want to see this. And uh, this is uh, um, at John C. Roscoe uh, as twit on, uh, on Twitter, another very recommended follow. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Kit PNC Bio might like him in particular because they share that same uh, subversive little snark <laughs> thing where they say the things that they would say, but you know it's tongue planted from lean cheek. But so the, uh, this, this is what... It, this is a bot farm, folks, if you've never seen one before. This is how some people earn their livings. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame the folks that they're just trying to earn a living. I, I don't blame them. I don't. I blame the folks who hire them. That's, this is what we're up against. Yeah. I love it. <sighs> the response on online has been overwhelming. <laughs> That's why I'm saying you might like <laughs> snark, <you know. laughs> people like that little yeah. snark might uh, like john roscoe's account very much uh, i get a good kick out so yeah kids and cubs uh we're, we're, again this is not normal we're not dealing with normal but again the more that they weird is sticking because what they're doing objectively is weird this and you're not calling them bad people. Well, I, I you're not saying that. that they're racist. You're not saying they're bigots. You're not saying they're deplorable. They ought to be ashamed. Of. They wear all of that stuff like a badge of honor. You know, I, I want to know why there's no invest investigative journalist digging into this, and I think I know why. Most of them are owned by a sixty. I think sixty-six or sixty-seven percent of Canadian media is owned by uh, right-wing hedge fund from the U.S. Chatham Asset Man Management, and then there's you know. Uh, what do we got? The Toronto Star, which is not even owned by left wingers anymore. Most Canadian media has supported conservatives over the last, what, 50 years of elections? Mm -hmm. I think we have records that go back 30, if memory mm -hmm. serves. It, it's. So, this is why weird works. It's a quote from Mark Twain. Mr. Grizzly? You take the lies out of him, and he'll shrink to the size of your hat. You take the malice out of him, and he'll disappear. Mark Twain. And that's what we need to do Samuel to this guy. Clemens. That's what we need to do to this guy. Yeah. We I need an investigative journalist somewhere to get on this. Well, that's the thing. This was highlighted by an account. I think it's called Trivia 280. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A citizen. A citizen. It. Investigative journalists, where are you? Media, where are you? Elections Canada, where are you? CSIS, where are you? RCMP, where are you? People are trying to interfere directly with your right to cast a fully informed vote. That should not be happening. That should be illegal. 
if there's one thing that should be illegal in democracy is trying to interfere with someone's right to vote and someone's right to cast a fully informed vote. Well, I, I happen to love this quote because this is taken from uh, Billy Mann. And it's, uh, someone should say this after anything Mr. Polyev says. Mr. Polyev, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. I want somebody to say that to him. I believe that's from a movie, isn't it? It's from Billy Madison. Okay, yes. <laughs> it's from Billy Madison, yes. Uh, I just, uh, all right. Now that um, we got done with the uh, greasy... We're gonna we're gonna jump into some Stop. Olympic coverage because I, I yeah. think I, I I need some I need something good. Yes. All right, uh, kits and cubs. I do believe, if I say so myself, that uh, the winners of this year's um, journalistic end of the years uh, male athlete and female athlete of the year are probably already decided I would based think on so. this Olympics. Um, summer, of course, clearly McIntosh for one. Not even close. And for the men. I believe it'll probably be Ethan, Ethan Katzberg. I believe so too. Because this man, this blade, six foot six and lean, not mm -hmm. a typical look, and looks a lot like Burton Cummings, which in Canada is a huge compliment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> More of a mullet than Burton ever had, but he's got the yes. mustache. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stood up in the qualifications, threw one shot through the qualifying standard, so he didn't have to throw his other ones. Then got to the final on his first shot. One and done. Yeah. That's all it took. Yeah. There, there were five more shots. Every, you know, a whole bunch of people got three, and then the top eight got three more. So they got six shots. But one and done. He was the only person in the field to shoot, to throw over 80 meters. There's one guy that came really close. He had like three of them, like in the 70, 79.97, 79.85, um, who got to, I believe he ended up getting the, the silver. Um, but yeah, he was the only like one. Four, four and a half meter difference. Like that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and he did it twice. Yeah. It's the ninth best, best hammer throw in history. One the and of calm concentration when he entered the stadium to the applause of over 70,000 fans. After his momentous win, reporters in the mixed zone interviewed the clearly delighted Olympic champion. They asked about his thoughts following the, his phenomenal first throw. I didn't want to assume, and so I wanted to stay focused in the competition and, you know, keep trying to improve my mark. Anything could happen in the Olympics, but fortunately, it was enough to seal the deal. Yeah, he was just shy of the Olympic record. Just mm -hmm. a smidge. One throw. The longest I watched, in the world since 2008. And I had never really watched hammer throw. When oh, he, it's, it's one of the, it's the toughest thing to do in athletics. Oh yeah. But I saw him wind up because, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I could, I can't say that I have watched hammer throw in previous, previous Olympics, but the speed at which this guy spins in the circle mm -hmm. compared to everyone else. So when he did it and it's like through, I was like, whoa, like I actually like said it out loud, like, whoa, <laughs> I screamed. I couldn't believe that a big guy like that one could move that fast. Number one and keep everything in line. Well, his remember, legs were actually crossed at the end. Yeah, remember Usain Bolt, he was six foot five and ran faster than any human being in history. Yep. So there are big men who are just agile and can move athletic. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, He's a big I mean, dude. He, 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 he wants to break the record is 86.74 meters. He's, he's intent on breaking it. Yep. The world record. Um, listen, that undeniable, undeniable he was, yeah. um, other success, Wyatt Sanford, uh, won Canada's first boxing medal, a bronze, in uh, I think 28 years. And uh, if you ever seen the interviews with him, he is a delight. Well, I, I was watching the fight that 
he won the bronze medal. He lost the fight, right? So yes. he gets the bronze medal. And after the fight, he immediately went to the corner of his opponent and they were both smiling and hugging and happy because he like, he said point blank, oh no, he beat me fair and square. Like, yep. He, he said, he's so quick. He's so fast. He's a better fighter. I've got work to do because I want to come back and do it again, but he's just a better fighter and I'm cheering for him to win the gold. I'm like, wow. Talk about magnanimous. My and goodness. it's like, you know, so, and super happy with my performance. Just mm -hmm. didn't get the result. I get the, the man is a delight. Yeah. I'm a fan right away. I didn't, wouldn't even have to have seen him box just the way he handled himself, handled himself after this. The man is a pure delight. Um, the women's eights uh, did not defend the gold, but did take home the silver. The only, we had one or two, one of two boats. Uh, the, the, the first boat, uh, which was also a metal, um, con uh, contender, um, had just a bad regatta. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. If you see the interview with them after the, you can see that they're crushed. It, it just didn't happen for them. Um, but I think they finished, uh, they got to repassage and then finished last in their heat and it, it just didn't work for them. Um, but we had two boats, one did bring home a medal. Um, but yeah, our, our rowing program clearly needs to be, uh, rebuilt. Um, Andre de Grasse and, uh, Aaron Brown had a tougher time in the 100 meter. Uh, Aaron Brown got disqualified in the heats mm -hmm. for false start. False start. You, um, you don't get, you don't get a break on that. Well, they changed the rules on that. They changed the rules. Yes. There used to be a false start. Like, uh, you, the whole group would get one false start, but it would apply to the whole group. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is that the, some people that were, uh, people would abuse of it. People that were good sprinters would sometimes twitch and whatnot to get people to go. Yeah. And then that would make them nervous to start again. And then they would just, they, they would get the jump on the second one. And that's why they did that. So now it's just right. one. I think one it should have just been into one, you know, two individual false starts and like this rather than like just one boom, because sometimes mm -hmm. there are noises and you can get distracted or somebody moves and, and that's somebody from claiming. the side of your eye. And that's what so, he was claiming, right? Cause he was going, I, I heard it. I heard it. Right. Yeah. Right. I heard or I saw something or whatever. He was like sort of pointing, but I went like this and he went, but yeah, um, I would prefer a rule that says, you know, individual, but I, then I guess if they're individual, then, you know, a whole bunch of people can try to get that jump and you could have several far starts and it would take longer to start the race. They are on a schedule. Um, but yes. Uh, and then Andre de Grasse, uh, made it to, uh, the semifinal, uh, and he did a run under 10 for the first time. He ran 998. Uh, problem is, is that the eight fastest times were 992, which is very fast and below. Um, so that, uh, it didn't happen, but he's still in for the 200. And so are Aaron Brown. Um, same thing for uh, Audrey Leduc. Audrey Leduc uh, got to the semifinal. Uh, didn't get a good start for the second, so didn't make it through, but it seems that she's more of a 200 uh, runner as well. Um, Josh Liendo and Ilya Karun. Yeah. Silver and bronze. Second and third. And, Silver and, and bronze. And the Josh one the missed the gold by an eyelash. Yes. And he missed a bronze in the 100 mm -hmm. that he wasn't supposed to be in because somebody else dropped out by 0 0.02 yeah. seconds from lane eight. He finished fourth by two hundreds of a second. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Our swimmers at summer Macintosh won the 200 IM in another Olympic record. So she set two, three golds, two Olympic records and a silver. Or no, it's silver. Yeah, yeah. Silver or bronze? Yeah. Silver. Yeah. 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 Three goals, I guess. And finished fourth uh, in the four by 100 uh, IM red medley. So there were no relay medals for Canada this time uh, at the Olympics. Uh, Kylie Mass finished fourth in the 100 back, but got bronze in the 200. Three Olympics in a row. She's got medals. She has five total over her career. People don't talk about her a lot, but. Uh, it's like Penny Alexiak has six, right? Maggie McNeil has five like this. Well, Kylie Mass has five too now. But yeah. she did over three Olympics getting some meddling in all three. Yeah. That's longevity. That's dependability. That's delivering in the clutch again and again and again. She deserves to be talked about a whole lot more. <laughs> Actually, but I mean, but hey, when you're in the center summer, 
shadow of Penny Alexiak one year and Summer McIntosh another year. And yeah, I mean, you know, like this, but quietly, the person getting it done in the background, like this, that's her, Kylie Mass. Uh, Evan Dunphy uh, finished fifth in the 20 kilometer race walk. Uh, he, is, uh, he was a medalist in Tokyo in the 50 kilometer race walk, but that event doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so that was his uh, opportunity. Um, women's basketball team. Ooh. Number fifth team in the world did not win a single match. Uh, their match against Nigeria, the last one, they had to win it and win it by about 10 points or something like that. You can't win a match when you uh, turn over the ball over 25 times in a match. No. You just can't. Uh, there's a coaching issue there. They uh, got rid of the coach after Tokyo. I think we talked about it uh, in the, the bonus show uh, on uh, on Friday. But um, yeah, uh, Germany picked up that coach. Germany's still in it. We're not. Maybe our sports federations need to stop making dumb decisions that interfere with our athletes' ability to perform. The coach that we had was a good coach. Mm -hmm. There was no reason to dispatch them. Germany picked them up. Germany did better. Come on, guys. And the same thing for Soccer Canada. Canada Soccer. Give our athletes what they need to succeed and get the hell out of their way. Our women's soccer team, the thing that I cautioned everybody about on our show, on the bonus show, um, to temper the expectations mm -hmm. because um, when you have something placed upon a burden and a weight placed upon you in the way that they have and you overcome that weight, often there's a moment of, <sighs> mm -hmm. and that's when you get caught. I see it happen in tennis all the time. People are down five, one, and they managed to battle back to bring it to 5-5. Five, five. Yes. And then it slips. After doing that, because you did all that work, all that focus, just to get back on level to give yourself a chance. And they think, okay, now I got a chance. I can breathe in. Boom. That's when you get it upside the head. Well, that's what happened against Germany. Uh, unfortunately, that does not take away anything from the incredible performance just to get there, considering all the adversity, all the adversity. So, um, women, standing ovation. And oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you, you know, because it was important, because people were saying Canada are cheaters, and you guys needed to prove, no, no, we're just a good damn team. And Look, you they, did that. They went into extra time. They played the added time. They played the extra time. And then they had to go to penalties. And the, look, penalties is thrilling to watch. But as I a player, it. it must suck to win and lose on penalties. Yeah. It's like, why play the game? It's something that I've had a few people who've been longtime football aficionados and fans, like lifetime mm -hmm. fans of, of the sport, have said, they need to stop doing this. What you do is when you go into extra time, you take two players off. Yes. And after the first extra time, nobody scored, you take two more off. Yes. And that, you know, like three on three in overtime right. in, in regular season in hockey, then they go to shootout. But I'm like, if you started pulling players off, I think that would be more effective. Yep. I, I like that idea better than what they're doing now. I've never liked the shooter. I've never liked the, the penalty kicks because it, especially in football, <laughs> the net is so damn big. I know. And then That's you'll have players who will roof it over the net or go wide. And it's like the, the amount of stress. And that's the thing that people fail to understand. I read an article, uh, Megan Rapinoe's partner wrote an article about how uh, you think, oh, you're the penalty kicker. This is an automatic goal. It's like, no, it's not automatic. And there's an incredible amount of stress on the kicker because they're trying to figure out where do I put it? And hopefully the keeper doesn't dive in that direction. Hopefully I can get it in the net and I don't go wide over the top or there's a lot of stress. Now, 
what happens? Usually they score, but not on every single one. I just, mm-hmm. it, 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 yeah, and this is it, right, from T. Wigmore. Penalty kicks is no way to settle a lengthy game. Just take the players off. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard that suggestion before, and actually it's a really damn good one. I like that better. Um, in archery, surprise, uh, a man, a Canadian named Eric Peters, who had surprised uh, the world uh, a while back by uh, taking a bronze medal at a world championship, uh, made uh, what finished in the top eight in his event, um, which is, has Canada ever come close to winning an archery medal ever? <laughs> I, I don't know. I've never heard of any uh, success uh, from the program, uh, but that was a pretty darn good result for him as well. Uh, women's basketball, three on three. Uh, the team had a rough day a couple of days ago, losing two matches in overtime, uh, a little bit with um, the um, uh, playing not to lose rather than playing to win. It mm-hmm. seems that on three and three basketball, the first team to score two points in overtime wins. And if you sh- like regular basketball, there's uh, the three point line. Well, in three on three, it's a two point line, and anything in is one point. Uh, so uh, you can either start overtime if you have first possession, trying to sink a two pointer and win it, mm-hmm. or trying to play it safer, sink the one point, try to get possession of the ball and sink it the other one. Uh, well, in the first match, they scored the one point, and then the other team just tried a shot from the two point line and then sunk the team. That was the end of it. I watched. That was the end of it. Um, I watched the Canada Nigeria match yesterday morning, and Nigeria was just a better team. Oh, Canada yeah. mounted a comeback, but they needed to win by ten points, and they lost by I think eight. So they yeah. they, they were had, down by ten in the first quarter. Yeah, managed to get it back in, up. They, they were brought up in by Bridget four. Carlton, who who started scoring left, right, and yeah. center. They got up by ten at some point in the second. Yeah. Ended the end. Uh, ended uh, that uh, that quarter uh, up by four, and then just disappeared. Yeah, they felt turnovers. Uh, I mean, Kia Nurse, I think, was like at one point in the match was like three baskets for twelve attempts. Yeah, she just uh, it wasn't her day. It just it wasn't her tournament. Apparently, no. things weren't connecting. Uh, missed receptions, drop balls, fumbles, scrambles. Uh, just uh, the, I, I saw match. I, uh, there was there were some matches I saw where like like four minutes went by and not one basket was sunk other mm-hmm. than a free throw. Yeah. They that just can't, that can't happen. They just didn't have it. And they just that, didn't have it. It wasn't working for that them. Happens. Yeah. Yep. It just wasn't happening. Everybody has like, I said, there are days I go play tennis. And it's like, I, I play like a rock star and there are other days. It's just like, like, have you ever held a racket before? Like what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> and against people like, you know, not like I'm playing some, like some guy that smokes me. It's like, you know, I've defeated you before. Yeah. As like, today I lost eight one. What the heck? <laughs> so, you know, it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, the men's basketball team, however, doing quite well. Uh, they're in the playoffs and they got a really good draw, not on the same side of the draw as the United States. Uh, so it looks, anyway, the possibility of a Canada US final for gold exists in theory. So this should be an interesting, uh, a few interesting matches. Uh, in judo, uh, Sh- uh, Shadi El Nahas uh, had a terrible first round uh, and got eliminated. Turns out that uh, he had an injury to his thumb a couple of weeks before, which kind of makes it hard for judo because you're grappling. Uh, but said, you know, it's okay. We still have the mixed team event, and uh, they lost in the first round there too. So uh, th- that was a little uh, a little tougher. Mm. Uh, in tennis. I uh, mentioned it on the Sunday, on uh, the, the extra show, but uh, Gabriela Dabrowski and Felix Ogialesim uh, did win bronze medal in mm-hmm. mixed doubles. Uh, that's the Canada's second tennis medal uh, in history because the first one was in 2000 in Sydney, the first year that it was. Daniel Nestor, of course, uh, with Sebastian Laro, won the gold then. Um, and uh, Felix Ogialesim had a chance, was playing Carlos Algaraz for the chance to play in the gold medal match. Uh, he got smoked 6 1 6 1. Uh, then got to the bronze medal match, and I was playing uh, a guy from Italy named Musetti, uh, who, if he gets on a roll, is very dangerous. Uh, he won the first uh, set, uh, I believe it was very close. Uh, Ogiliasim smoked him in the second, looked like he had, you know, uh, was going to go all the way with it, but then the, the third set, well, it didn't go his way. Uh, I think in that one, 
um, there may have been uh, some choices made that were probably not to the best advantage. Uh, the schedule was such that uh, he was the person who's played the most tennis, period. <laughs> and there because he got to a semifinal in mixed doubles and in doubles. And he had unfortunately lost in the first round in men's doubles with Milos Raonic. Um, and along the way, I mean, he took out the number five in the world, who he had never beaten in seven matches, then took out the number nine in the world, who's the best player on clay other than Nadal currently playing, and then had to take on Carlos Alcaraz, who was number one in the world until not too long ago like this, and has gone 4-0 in his first four Grand Slam finals. At some point, the tank's going to run out. Uh, but on the day that he played Casper Ruud, uh, he was also playing his mixed doubles uh, uh, match, and uh, they would allow him more rest if he wanted it, but he decided to take a, just a little bit of rest in order to rest up as much as he could for his match against Alcaraz in the hope for going for the singles gold, mm -hmm. which was a tougher ask, and in the process probably ran out of juice uh, in the doubles mixed double semifinal, which would have allowed him to qualify for the gold medal match. If you normally in regular tennis, you focus on the singles because right. well, the, the glory and the prize money is great, but at the Olympics, a gold medal is a gold medal. Whether it's mixed doubles or singles, it's a gold medal. So if he wanted gold, he might have been a better choice to take more rest before the mixed doubles match, the semifinal, try to win that one to get in the gold medal match, and then see what his luck in singles would be the next day. So, but that's it's a choice. Again, mm -hmm. in the Olympics, like I said, sometimes you know, if you decide you're going to compete to win and singles is the bigger glory, technically, even though a gold medal yeah. is a gold medal at the Olympics, but sing, you know, an it, individual yeah. medal over like this, then the decision makes sense that he went, he went for it because it didn't work out. But still, a bronze medal performance for him and Gabriela Dabrowski. So uh, that was really good. And uh, Cameron uh, Rogers qualified uh, for the final in uh, her hammer throw, and she qualified first as well. So uh, I think she's competing today, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, or tomorrow in that, but that's coming. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Damian Warner, which was the big story. Uh, triathlon, uh, not triathlon, decathlon, um, was doing well. Uh, not as well as he was hoping to be doing, uh, but well, uh, he was in second place after the first day and after the first event of the second day, uh, the running events seemed to be a stronger, uh, stronger ones of the three. Uh, he had taken the lead again and then got to the coal vault and missed his three jumps. Didn't record a score and well, tumbled down the standings. And if you don't record a score in an event, you really can't win. So pulled out from then on. Uh, from the event, uh, which was disappointing uh, because, you know, everybody was, <laughs> he was one of the people that people were looking at as an inevitable as well, right? And the day just didn't happen. For, it happens, right? Mm -hmm. It happens, especially pole vaulter and high jump. Those are the ones that the people usually get caught on if they're going to they're gonna foul out. Um, but he delivered a press uh, conference afterwards and said, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not done. <laughs> so he's going to stay in competition. And same goes for Ellie Black, uh, she's 28, gymnast, mm -hmm. um, finished sixth in the all-around while falling off the balance beam, which is her best, I guess, because she went for it. Yeah. Again, well, and you have she, to compete, she competed to win. The, the woman who's, who's claimed the silver from Brazil, whose name is escaping me at the moment, is Andrade. a whisker. Yes, she's a whisker behind Simone Biles. Yes. Simone so, Biles is not just a generational athlete it's likely that in our lifetime we will never see anybody mm -hmm. do what she's done mm -hmm. yeah. they've taken they've she's invented moves that they won't let her do in competition because yep. nobody else can do them yep and uh simone biles says of andrade because she used to be first by so far mm -hmm. i don't like that she's pushing me <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's like, you're, you're getting too close i don't like that uh but uh, ellie black will be competing uh in the floor exercise apparatus final uh today um but she's 28 still sixth in the overall she's still getting better yeah 
Right. So uh, she's she loves it. She says like you know she says she's not committing to the next full Olympic cycle, uh, but as long as she still loves gymnastics, she's going to do it. And let's remember that in gymnastics, over time, right, you can go from all around to individual apparatus mm -hmm. specialists. And she has a couple in which she's really good on. And, and remember, you can keep, given that, you can keep competing in gymnastics for a long time. I think it was one or two Olympics ago, there was a gymnast from Bulgaria who was in her 40s who yes. won a bronze on the vault. Yeah. So, um, so long as that there's room on the team, because some teams bring one person in who's a specialist for the, the team competition to help them. Mm -hmm. So long as she's healthy, because... Um, and so long that there, so long as there isn't a, another female gymnast that comes around that can all around as well or better, she pretty much has a permanent spot on that team. I think so. All she well, wants. Uh, she, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I saw because I follow Simone Biles on, on the Twitter, and one of the things she said yesterday that I'm like, yes, is stop asking athletes what their plans are after right. they win the gold medal. Let them save for the moment. It. Like, come on, man. It's like, what, are your, what are your future plans? I, I'm going to go have some beers with friends and celebrate the fact that I got a gold medal in the Olympics? Like, yes. What's well, like, a stupid question. But it's that's like, hey, this great thing just happened now. Let me pull you out of this moment to bring you into the... Why? Yeah. Well, another one, too, that I've heard a lot of as of late, and, and my lovely wife pointed out to me, and I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. She's a serious competitor. Why they're do you all think at the she's Olympics? there? <laughs> they're at the Olympics. They're all serious competitors at that level. Do you, do you remember a time when sports writers and sports commentators used to be some of the best in the business at their craft? And, and sometimes, oftentimes, sports writers and sports commentators would move on to hard news because they were so good at writing and at diction and at delivering. And there's just not enough of them anymore. And, and Devin, words. Our, our friend Devin is really good at his job. Yes. That's why I follow him because he's got such uh, insightful commentary. And he's, he's a good person too. That doesn't hurt. But I don't think he'd ever ask a question as dumb as that or make a statement as, she's a serious competitor. Yeah. Why, why do you think she's there? As a, you think about that, but people, you're right, because people look down their nose at sports writers. But think about it, right? baseball how many mm -hmm. teams are there hockey teams how many ways can you say defeat it yeah it's not that like the the blackhawks defeated the flames and then the toronto Maple police defeated them. It's, like, yeah. it's like it would be a boring they defeated got passed trounced mm -hmm. eked by squeaked by this, well, something, this, they're good at words <laughs> who's a writer had told me years ago sports writers are some of the best writers in the business period yes because they need it. You already know the outcome of the game. And yet you're still going to read their column. <laughs> and, they, and they pull you in and keep you there. Yeah. So sports writers are very good at what they do. But it seems that the, uh, the bar has been lowered. Yes. Maybe I'm wrong. But just you know. what I've noticed. Yep. And uh, also, because uh, we didn't mention it at all. Um, Safian Metot, Metot or Metot. Bronze medal. Trampoline gymnastics oh yes yeah yeah. surprise yeah. medal well and and yes the, and the uh, tumble the chinese uh competitor who was expected <sighs> to win the gold i was watching it we were watching it live and i looked at i Britain was nervous she well it, it took her forever yes to get going i said i yes. think there's something wrong bridget she yes was mine. i go she hasn't started she's been bouncing up and down for like 20 yes. seconds there's something off yes she might have the twisties or something i had the she same did one feeling. move and it was not landed in the in the square and she right. did the second one and landed on her back on the edge of the trampoline and that was it it was done she was out yeah because that's an in trampoline as soon as you're like you're, you're, you're as finished. soon as you your moves done you don't get in, in regular gymnastics you fall off the apparatus you can get back on finish your routine trampoline, yeah, trampoline. No. no it's done, done. so I, I think she there was something wrong right away i'm like oh yeah she's anxious or has the twisties or there's something not right because yeah. it must and have been. she was 15 or 20 seconds before she made her first attempt at yeah. anything. And I was like, that, that's not normal. And she was the highest jumper. Oh, her amplitude she was, the, was she insane. Was, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's like, like I'm sitting there, like, start, go. When's she going to go? Why is she not going? Okay, this is weird. Yeah. It something, just took forever. Yeah. So you had the sense that something was, was going off. to happen. Yeah, as soon as she started, it was like I had this like mm, this feeling of dread. Something's gonna happen here, and and it did. 
And uh, it was a pretty spectacular thing. Now, fortunately, the ends are soft, and but she landed and sort of like flipped over. But yeah. fortunately, she did not land on the back of her neck or like she probably just she landed could have been just severely on, hurt, just on the top of her yeah. back there or something like that. But uh, it, it did but, not look good. No, no, not at all. <laughs> it's like I was like, yay! <laughs> yeah. You know, when you watch the Olympics, something oh, yeah, happens. Yeah. And it was one of those moments. Yeah, that, that, that was frightening. Now, there is a bit of an issue um, in the pool. Oh, do tell. Well, uh, three of the four uh, swimmers from Team China who won the gold medal in the 4 by 100 meter relay, or the 4 four by one yeah, 4 by 100 meter relay yesterday. The um, IM? They had tested positive for a banned substance yes. uh, some time ago. Yes. Uh, I think in the last Olympics, if memory serves. Mm-hmm. So other swimmers are saying, come on, do your damn job. We know they're, they're swimming dirty. And, and oftentimes I think, is that just an accusatory tone? But then again, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time somebody's been caught cheating at the Olympics. And it won't yeah. be the last. So there's a bit of controversy because even Katie Ledecky spoke up. I'm like, Katie Ledecky, she owns every record. Yep. Like so does Adam greatest, Yeah. She and Michael Phelps are the two greatest swimmers of all time, period. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and Petey spoke up as well. So it's like, there's, there's maybe this needs to be looked into. I don't know. I, I'm not accusing anybody of anything because I don't know enough about it to, to make a comment. So I watched the, that relay and the Chinese team looked amazing. They did. Maybe mm-hmm. they're just great athletes, but the, the, the accusations been leveled and they do have, you know, a, a, a history. So might, might be worth looking into. Yeah. The other, um, when you say the greatest swimmer of all time, um, a lot of people don't know her name, but, uh, because you know, she's not as famous, but, uh, Sarah Schostrom as well, who yes. was there from Sweden, yeah, from Sweden who yeah. won the, the 50 and 100 free. And she, I think she's won the 50 and 100 free, like for the last like 10 years or something. Yeah. So she's got yeah. medals up the yin yang. Um, but yeah, uh, according to, uh, Associated Press Olympic swimmers smoke out about, spoke out about the Chinese doping scandal that has hung over these Paris Olympics as the events finished Sunday night. China won the men's four by 100 meter medley relay in three minutes, 27.46 seconds with two of the four members of the team listed among the 23 Chinese swimmers who tested positive ahead of the Tokyo Olympics three years ago. The swimmers were allowed to compete after a Chinese investigation ruled that they consumed food that had been contaminated. Now, this was an investigation by the Chinese Sport Association. They reported back, so, okay, we investigated it, and this is what it was, and it was all clear. And it seems that there wasn't any further investigation by higher authorities done. Um, That's quote, suspicious. In sport, one of my favorite quotes I've seen lately is, quote, there's no point in winning if you don't win it fair, British star Adam Peaty said after his foursome wound up fourth to miss the medal stand. I think you know that truth in your heart. So even if you touch and you know you're cheating, you're not winning, right? So for me, if you've been on that and you've been contaminated twice, I think as an honorable person, it means you should be out of the sport. We know sport is not that simple. Um, so yeah, it was a, a pretty big uh, doping scandal that came before. And I, I don't know what it is again with this... Uh, with the, the Olympics, but it seems that they've abandoned really all of it because the Sochi thing that happened and the Russian athletes are still competing. And I know you're not supposed to punish the athletes. You should punish the Federation, but the Federation has cleaned up, won't clean up, refuses to clean up. At some point, you just got to ban the athletes and hope that the athletes put pressure on the government to cheat. So, but for some reason, if it's Russia and if it's China, we try to find some exceptions and some rules and whatnot. Like, uh, yes, you can still participate. But if it's Canada or a smaller nation, then the hammer falls on you. So I do not know what it is uh, with the refusal to actually just punish Russia and China. Um, but yeah, uh, those nearly two dozen elite Chinese swimmers tested for banned substance ahead of Tokyo Games and were allowed to compete with no ramifications whatsoever. Um, there are cheaters all around the world. There's no doubt in my mind, said 1984 Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines, now commentator for NBC Sports. But when it comes systemic, that's a whole different issue. Mm-hmm. Um, the World Anti-Doping Agency kept the book closed on the swimmers 
who tested positive for banned heart medication ahead of the Olympics. Five of those swimmers went on to win medals, including three golds. There. Uh, WADA had accepted the explanation of the Chinese anti-doping officials that its athletes had ingested the banned substance through contaminated food at a hotel. World Aquatics, the governing body of swimming, went along with that decision. Quote, it should have been handed differently for a matter of respect, respect for the entire swimming and sports world, Italian swimmer Niccolò Martinegi said. The situation needs to be fixed. With 11 swimmers who tested positive ahead of Tokyo set to compete in Paris, criticism of the world's anti-doping regulatory regulator only increased. Quote, if the international sports world continues to have its integrity impacted by the failures at WADA, the next generation isn't going to be able to have the same belief that I once had in the system, Phelps said during recent testimony before the U.S. Congress. So with this, I urge you, the members of Congress, to engage in the fight against doping. We can uphold the values of fairness and integrity that are the cornerstone of Olympic and Paralympic sport. To that end, the U.S. has launched a criminal investigation into how the Chinese doping cases were handled. Brent Nowicki, the executive director of World Aquatics, has been subpoenaed to testify before Congress. World Aquatics said man at Monday that the Chinese swimmers going to Paris were undergoing increased, increased drug testing of at least eight times this year before the Games. But all of this comes too late to make it up to those who may have been cheated out of medals in Tokyo. Take Ledecky, who swam a stellar anchor leg in the 4 by 200 meter freestyle relay to finish off a time that would have broken the previous world record, only to have a Chinese squad that included Zhang Yufei go even faster by four tenths of a second to take both the gold and the world record. Zhang was among those who failed the pre-Olympic doping test. Ledecky now knows what a swimmer like Shirley Babashoff, who was dubbed Surly Shirley for griping about the sudden rise of the East Germans in 1976 Montreal Olympics, must have felt like, especially mm -hmm. when her suspicions were proven to be correct. Quote, it's tough to accept as an athlete and now also to feel what it's like to be an athlete who won a silver medal behind some athletes who tested positive, Ledecky told CBS. I've seen it before with other athletes and always felt for them. The doping revelations are sure to cast a pall over the swimming competition, especially if the Chinese have a strong performance. They didn't have as strong a performance mm -hmm. uh, as in past Olympics. They were fourth in the medal table at the Tokyo Games with three goals and six medals overall. And they are coming off a stellar showing at the 2024 World Championships in Doha, Qatar, with seven golds and a total of 11 medals. China trailed only the United States at that meet, though it must be noted that many top swimmers skipped the most recent worlds because of its unusual timing in another mm. year. Uh, so yeah, that's going on. Um, the other thing that happened uh, when I'm talking about Russia getting special treatment, because even though it's the Summer Olympics, there's little Winter Olympics news because the Court of Arbitration for Sport finally came down with this decision about the team figure skating competition from the last Olympics, in which Canada had finished fourth. But Team Russia, female single skater, uh, Camila Valieva, um, was, uh, had been caught uh, with a banned substance. She was 15 at the time mm -hmm. in her body. Uh, uh, and um, there were three different stories about how it got in her system. And because uh, she was under the age of 16, she had special protection uh, because um, I think very few people would assume that a 15 year old on her own would decide, Hey, I need to cheat. That someone says you need to take this or maybe didn't even tell her that she was taking it. Uh, but the court, so what happened was, is that, uh, when that was found out, they uh, dropped the Russians from gold to bronze because mm -hmm. they removed her scores from the team competition. And that brought them to bronze. And Team Canada turned around and said, uh, no, no, wait a minute. They should be out. Out of the completely, competition period. Yeah. I guess, and we should be bronze. So they put an appeal. Well, the Court of Arbitration for Sport has dismissed a, Canadian, dismissed a Canadian appeal of the International Skating Union's decision to award the bronze medal in the team figure skating event from the 2022 Beijing Olympics to Russia. The Court for Arbitration of Sport said in a release Friday that the ISU correctly reallocated the points in the event after the retroactive disqualification of Camila Valieva, which dropped the Russians from first to third and elevated the United States to gold and Japan to silver. The Canadian appeal had challenged the ISU decision and argued Canada should have been given points after Valieva's disqualification that would have given it the bronze medal. So basically, in the team competition, if you finish first, you get a certain number of points second, whatever. So Valieva finished ahead of the Canadian figure skater, single skater. So her points should have been removed, and they're saying that the Canadian should have been moved up and gotten mm -hmm. the two extra points for that, which would have put us ahead of Russia. 
they turned around and says, no, the only thing that we need to do is eliminate our points. The problem is, is that if you just eliminate, if it's a team figure skating competition mm -hmm. and one member was not eligible to compete, you didn't field a full team. It's not like she skated and got a zero, but mm. still completed the routine. They didn't field. If you're banned from the competition, you didn't field a skater. You fielded an incomplete team. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you should lose. The COC is disappointed with the decision by CAS to not award Canada the bronze medal for the figure skating team event at Beijing. We believe that under the International Skating Union's rules, the points should have been reallocated following the doping sanction against Russian skater Kamila Valieva, and it is unfortunate that the CAS did not agree. We applaud Team Canada's figure skaters for having entered this lengthy process with grace, and we admire them for the performance on and off the ice. Uh, so Valieva's... Uh, disqualification removed maximum 10 points for each of her two events, but that still gave Russia one more point than fourth place Canada in the revised standings. Um, and the thing was, is that uh, Canada's female uh, skater, Madeleine Skizas, uh, skated the performance of her life mm -hmm. in that one. You know, when they say higher, faster, stronger, on that day, she did achieve higher, faster, stronger. So she earned it oh, yes. for us. It wasn't a fluke, wasn't like, because she shouldn't have done that well. She skated the performance of her life. And that clearly was not recognized or good enough. Uh, now this is stuff that we need to stop saying. Skate Canada respects the decision by the Court of Arbitration for Sport regarding the allocation of medals. While we are disappointed that the ruling does not award Canada the bronze medal, we stand by the efforts and performances of our athletes. No, do not respect the decision. Stop respecting the decision. This is once again making special, oh, well, the rule says this, but we found this special little interpretation that we're going to do here in this case, so that Russia, once again, with a reputation, like, like how many times does Russia have to cheat for you to finally just drop the hammer? Somebody's getting paid from Putin, is all I can say. You got to remember, the IOC is not exactly a squeaky clean organization. No, neither is the ISU, remember? And, and, well, here's the other There's the whole reason why we the scoring system change from 6.0 and everything yes. reviewed, by, reviewed by radio. And once again, it was Canadians that got screwed in that one too. Yeah. yeah. They did finally get the medal out of it. But, you, you know, one of the things I've suggested. But they to, didn't take the medal away from the Russians, though. No, didn't they? and they should have. Double because gold. they didn't deserve it. They didn't That's what it. I mean. Again, all of these accommodations and sudden changes of the rule to accommodate it, Russia a, over and simply, over and over again. It's a Putin payoff got to be now one of the things that i think they should do for any judged sport in the olympics is start using ai and getting humans out of it altogether train an ai to figure out what a proper move is it can judge it in real time it can see any errors or imperfections and then score accordingly i think that would be the way to do it you could have one that would do the technical and then the other ai could do the artistic for figure skating as an example for skateboarding, for big air, for that stuff. Uh, things that require judges, replace it with AI. Take the human element out of it, and then there's no possibility of corruption. Somebody said, well, the AI was, no, the AI thinks on its own. <laughs> it, it thinks on its own. It, you can't control AI, mm. which is why we can't totally unleash it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could, well, I'm, th I'm thinking, Linda, we could, train AI to understand artistic merit in, in figure skating as an example, or ice dancing or pairs, uh, male, female. It, I think that's a possibility. I'm not an expert on AI, so I could be entirely wrong here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I think it was Rosie D'Amano, um, that might've had a good, uh, article on this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't find it, uh, off the, but I had read it, something on it and she had a really interesting take on it. She was able, uh, to explain, uh, the rule. Oh, there we go. Very well. 
um, in it. Uh, fallout from the Camila Valley of a figure skating doping scandal at Beijing Olympics is simple. Canada was robbed. So this is Rosie D'Amato, a star columnist. Um, and whoops, <laughs> it seems that this one is under the paywall. So hold on and bear with me for a second while I try to bring it up in another way. Uh, or I might be able to access it for you. There you go, kits and cubs. Uh, there we go. Uh, so Canada gets screwed six ways from Sunday. And maybe with this country now held up to the world as cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater, that whole stealth drone thing, which was which very nearly put the kibosh on the women's soccer team, few will shed any tears for the bronze figure medal, finger, sorry, bronze figure skating medal from Beijing that hasn't absolutely will not be rewarded to Team Canada as it damn well should have been. The court of arbitration for sport has proven to be as cockamamie, wrong-headed, and stubbornly stiff-necked as the International Skating Union. They're both dictatorial potentates, unwilling for unfathomable reasons to properly put the punishment boots to chronic doping chicanery by Russia. Again, wonderful writing. Mm. I love that. Here we have everybody agreeing that Camila Valieva did indeed test positive for banned substance in a test administered six weeks before the Beijing Games, a tiny detail that only became public after the much heralded figure skating phenomenon phenom had already propelled Russia to gold in the team event with two first place finishes short and long programs. Because Valieva was 15 at the time, she was deemed a protected minor, permitted to compete in the following individual competition where she flamed out under the scandal's glare anyway. So uh, in the in the team competition, she finished first in both of her categories, but when they got to the individual single skate, which is why they tried so hard to keep her in there, so because she was like, seemed to be a lock for gold for Russia in singles, mm -hmm. and uh, the stress of it finally got to her. Again, not fair to do this to a 15-year-old girl where she, she imploded on the ice on the world stage with billions of people watching and all the cameras and we haven't really heard from her ever again mm -hmm. um, at least that I know of in terms of competition during investigations Valieva was the cock that crowed three times offering three versions of how the drug trimetazidine prescribed to treat angina banned in sports because it can increase endurance came to be in her system threw her grandfather under the bus for one thing she see he takes the drug for his heart ailment, not true, the court for arbitration for sport would determine, and sometimes he crushes the pills, and this time he must have used that same knife or maybe the chopping board when he prepared a raspberry dessert for Valieva, which he took on the train to the Russian championships. Or perhaps, she complained about security, somebody had slipped the drug into her fruit dinghy when she left it in a fridge in the athlete's lounge. The ISU then decided to strip Team Russia of gold by deleting Valieva's scores from the medal math. Any person with half a brain reading ISU rule number 353, quote, Competitors having finished the competition and who initially placed lower than the disqualified competitor will move up accordingly in their placement, would take that to mean march up the podium for the three teams that finished behind Russia. Because she didn't finish the competition mm -hmm. because she was never allowed to be in the competition in the first place. Might, might have something to do with it. I'm just Go back. speculating. Yes. Which, in fact, is how the U.S. sitting silver emerged with gold in a decision released by the ISU this past January, two years after the Beijing Games. Third place Japan was elevated to silver. But Russia, while scraped back to bronze, still gets a medal, although no Russian's Winter Games version will be around to accept the hardware when a ridiculously delayed figure skating medal ceremony is held here, smack in the middle of the Summer Games at Champions Park on Wednesday. Russia, instead of being after the fact, punted from the event and expunged from those records, gets bronze. Fourth place Canada gets bupkis. Madeleine Skeet says, who skated her heart out for Canada that week, pulled her compatriots into the final five countries by placing third in the team event short and fifth in the three segment. That should have seen her points tally rise from 16 to 18 when all scores were tallied, Canada topping out at 55, just clear of Russia, when Valieva's 20 points were knocked out, ergo Canada bronzed. But no, the ISU took the position, applying another rule it pulled out of its arse that didn't adjust for those crucial two points added. And the ISU in its review was willing to die on that hill, concluding early this year that the wandering two points could not be added to Canada's score, quote, because of applicable rules and principles that are specific to the Olympic team event. And on Thursday, the CAS endorsed that finding, rejecting the appeal that had been filed by the Canadian Olympic Committee on behalf of Skeetsis, Piper Gillis, Paul Poirier, Kristen Moore-Towers, Michael Marinero, Eric Bradford, and Vanessa James. 
the Court for Arbitration of Sport Tall Foreheads, aligning with the ISU, they're both based in Lausanne, Switzerland, takes the position that while Rule 353 can mean adjusting placements, it doesn't inherently mean points will be adjusted. That does a solid for the ISU, which argued that the rules don't allow for points redistribution even after an athlete has been disqualified. What a load of bollocks. Yeah. The ruling the IOC chimed in arrived, quote, just in time to still be able to make the medal allocation for gold and silver possible during the Olympic Games Paris 2024. Well, bully for America and Japan. Quote, there are no athletes or teams representing Russia and Paris, as the Russian Olympic Committee is currently suspected, the IOC said in a statement. For this and for logistical reasons, there cannot be a medal ceremony here in Paris for the ROC team that got the bronze medal. There may be no Russians on the podium step come Wednesday, only 15 Olympians from Russia in Paris formally designated individual neutral athletes, Russia nation non grata for its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, but Canada has been afforded no invitation either, because no medal. Which didn't sit well with the Canadian Olympic Committee, but what's a National Olympic Committee to do? Hmm. And then, you know, the statement that, that I mentioned... The COC is disappointed with the decision by the CS not to award the bronze medal. The COC said in a release statement, we believe that under the International Skating Union's rules, the point should have been reallocated, blah, blah, blah. Such politesse with inner sanctums of global sports. Wouldn't say merde if they had a mouthful. So I will. <laughs> You're full of crap. Court for arbitration for sports. Wow. Wow. Sports writers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the one thing I forgot to mention. Mm -hmm. Mo Ahmed. Oh, yeah. Oh. He just missed the 10,000. Oh. Came in fourth. He was so Mo. close. If well, there's he still one has the Canadian 5, guy. Yes. He still has the 5,000 to run. And it's a stronger event. It but is a stronger event. One guy, one guy on the whole Canadian Olympic team that I am pulling for. Yeah. It's Mo Ahmed. He, now, he does have an Olympic medal. He did get silver in Tokyo. Correct, 5, for the 5,000, yeah. But it was like sixth, 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 often. And his first sixth in a couple of Olympics ago got upgraded to fourth mm -hmm. because people doped and Cheated. got eliminated. Cheated. They just, this time, but literally, the definition of leaving it all on the field of play, mm -hmm. the well, visual he, he, liquid reputation, he is it. He should medal in the 5,000, possibly the gold. He could do the gold. I'd love to see him win the gold in the 5,000. He really wants to win the 10,000, though. I saw him interviewed post-race by Devin, and he was like, I'm, I'm bound and determined to do this. So I'm like, well, go for it, man. I hope you can. Now, there was a ton of contact in that race. I'm so oh, yeah. surprised nobody got disqualified. There were people touching, mm -hmm. moving, pushing like this. Um, the 10,000 meters is a grueling race, too. Yeah. Like, cause, and people can understand that, right? Like, because a lot of like people go go and run to 10K for exercise and practice. Like, people know how hard that is. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why this man gets more people run a 10 kilometers in Canada on a daily basis than run 100 meters. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so people understand that, right? They know how hard it is. So, like, this guy has mad respect. Mm -hmm. um, his post-race interview, brilliant. Dropped an f bomb. Some prudes might get their knickers up in a snit about that. No, no. The Olympics are the ultimate in reality TV. The thrill yeah. of victory, the agony of defeat, mm -hmm. the crushing ah of coming Goodness so close yeah. like this. But he literally said, I ran a fucking great race. He did. And he did. Yeah. No shame in that game whatsoever. No, I'm really pulling for him in the 5,000. I, yeah. I hope he can... I'd love to see him win the gold. Oh, I'd be happy if he gets a medal, but I'd love to see him win me the gold. Me too. He deserves it. He has been so consistent over three Olympic cycles. Yeah. Like he, I think, I think he will win the gold in the 5,000. I, I really do believe he, he can do it. Because he was that close to a bronze in the 10,000, which is not his specialty. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a grueling race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's shift gears for a minute before we wrap it up. I've got a, I got something I want to, I got a couple of photos I want to share with you. The, this first one is uh, charming and delightful and you'll get a lot. Why? Who's that? I know. It's, uh, Billie Jean King met the incomparable Snoop Dogg. Both of us were born and raised in Long Beach, California and graduated from Long Beach Polytechnic High School. Long Beach, California forever in our hearts. 
Mm-hmm. Snoop and Billie Jean King. Yes, and he had like pictures like this. I was pleased to meet Billie Jean and her wife. Yes. Like this. Because a lot of people, and the only reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know, rap yeah. and the gay thing, mm-hmm. right? There's history. And then there's a lot of things like within the black community, stereotypically, mm-hmm, particularly mm-hmm. in the United States, being openly gay or mm-hmm. like this. So to see Snoop Dogg being with Billie Jean King, like this, and going, like, this is my girl. Yeah. Well, and hey. I, so I, I, what was it I saw a couple of years ago? There was a photo, because he and Martha Stewart are, are actually good friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for real. So I saw a photo of the tomb together, and, and the photo tagged was, one of these is a convicted felon. The other is Snoop Dogg. <laughs> one of these two people is a convicted felon. Right. I'm like, that's funny. She's got more street cred than Snoop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he even he said that. Martha's gangster. Yeah. <laughs> here's another one for you, which is, is ironic. And I'll just leave it at ironic. You make your own decision. Tavi G sent me this one. This is um, new Ford stickers. Yes. ER closed. Come on, yes. folks. You got your license plate rebates. Yeah. And you cut more money from the healthcare budget this year. Yes. I do not like that man. No. I do not like that man. One bit. He's got to go. He's got to. Oh, and apparently uh, the, all the backhoes and all those uh, uh, equipment at Ontario Place, uh, they're now tearing down buildings. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's, he's going through. He's pushing it. He's going to make it happen. He doesn't care. This now is I have a 29 second clip for you that I think you'll like in case you haven't seen this. I don't know if you have or not. This is, uh, this was posted, uh, very recently, like within the hour. I don't know when this took place though. Possibly yesterday. I could be wrong, but, uh, here. Awesome. Take care. Hey boss. Hey. Uh, pride is about coming together and celebrating what it means to be Canadian in our full diversity, in our respect for each other, in the freedom to be who you are, to love who you love. This is what pride's about. It's worth celebrating. It's worth fighting for. It's all about being Canadian. It's in Vancouver. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and it was a surprise. Nobody expected him to go. He took some time from his vacation and stopped in at Pride. Yeah, because he is on vacation. We are still waiting for the leader of the opposition to tell us what he was going to do for Pride last year. Um, we're also waiting for the leader of the opposition to congratulate a single Canadian athlete for their accomplishments in the Olympics. Mm. Mm. Touché, sir. No commentary from him, just up there telling us how extreme the Prime Minister is. Mm. Weird. Uh, weird. He cannot be happy. No, he's miserable. This is a man. Pierre Polyev is a man who is incapable of joy. He's just incapable of joy. That's weird. Again. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed. Um, no. Yes. I have one more thing to share with Please, you. Please, go ahead, go ahead. Then we'll wrap it up, and I do have a good Easter egg. Oh, do I have it? Where did it go? Oh, I lost my Easter egg. Oh, well, let me share this with you, um, because this is sort of a retort to what we talked about earlier with the member of parliament from Oklahoma. Mm. So this is from, uh, who's this from? Jay Hunter on the Twitter, Mr. Joe K-E-R-604. And I'll share this on the screen and read it to you. When you mock the passing of Gord Downey and the emotions Canada felt in that moment, you stoop to a new low, showing what you are. This is what the CC, CPC have become under Pierre Polyev. It's probably because he loved our country and didn't spend every day shitting on it. And here's a picture of Gord Downey in, uh, performing on his final tour in full costume on stage and says, I love this country. I love my idea of this country. And you mock the prime minister for openly weeping about the death of that man. Michelle, seek therapy immediately. You've got a few screws loose. Behind this cup, got a little bit of sign language going on for you. I don't think you'd appreciate it. (sighs) 
Why do these people have? Why can't these people not be happy unless they're being ugly? Uh, some people just like to be miserable. <sighs> All right, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. Yes, Saucy, I think PR may have made a fatal mistake here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, yeah. There's certain things you don't touch. Gord Downey might be one of them. Yep. I think yeah. you might have a point there. Um, Remember, word of mouth is priceless. It's like coming for Dolly Parton in the United States, right? You, mm -hmm. you don't come for Gordon in Canada. You don't come for Dolly in the United States. You just don't. No. Uh, word of mouth is priceless, and uh, we want you to spread the word. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you would like to support us, thanks to the Ray Girl, you can make sure you don't miss an episode. Just scan the QR code that Mr. Grizzly is going to put up there for us. That will bring you to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and when you click subscribe there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth boom right in your inbox and you get it you don't even have to go looking for it, it just comes right to you hey we like to help and if you would like to help us in other ways then uh you need to make like kit elaine and have a beyond awesome day but before you do, remember to surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and smash the button before you leave. Like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. Make us happy. <laughs> we love it very much. And if you would like to support us in other ways, uh, the QR code that's up there by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you to our coffee page where you can find our tip jar where you can help contribute to us. Um, putting on this show that you like so very much and you know it has been hot and not a lot of rain over the past little day a few days so um we need to be moistened so if you can help with that we would really appreciate it thank you so much but remember the gift of your attention is the gift that we cherish the most and your gift participation so we love to hear from you True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is our email address or leave us a comment on our youtube page on our Twitter feed at True Eager or our Facebook page. And we do try to read everything. We're not always able to respond, but we do read everything. Uh, again, story suggestions, ideas. Thank you to everybody who sends them to us. That we really appreciate that as well. Uh, so uh, it's your show too. So uh, when you let us know what it is that you want us to talk about, that helps us out a lot. And well, you know, your queen beaver lives to serve. <laughs> I found my Easter egg. Good, good. All right. Um, because democracy is something that you do, kids and cubs, uh, throw on some red and white and spit in front of your TV and uh, cheer a little. Go get yourself some happy. There's some good stuff that Canadians will be doing over the next couple of days. Uh, the medal count is already uh, quite nice for Canada. Uh, the most I think we had was 24. We are currently at 17. We've still got about a week to go. Um, I think, uh, the, the company, uh, the same company that does ratings for TV, Nielsen had predicted originally about 24 and then uh, scaled that back to 20. So, uh, we're already a three behind and that's with, right. So many fourth place. If you mm -hmm. count the fourth places alone, there's at least eight or nine more oh, potential yeah. medals that we just came really close to. And then when you count things like Davy and Warner. Mm -hmm. who had was a out. lock for gold like in the 20 it was like damien gold is going to be one for sure well that well, didn't and, happen and that means somebody else had to pick up the slack and who was the other uh the other canadian i'm blanking on his name he the other canadian was expected to win the gold and he had to drop out from an injury from months ago that he yeah, still had recovered from. thank you chris lapage so between warner and lapage those two were gonna rally for the you know challenge each other mm -hmm. and push each other for the gold Lepage yeah. was injured and couldn't compete at all. And um, after the he blew the uh, the uh, pole vault, he bowed out of the javelin because I, I think he's probably suffering from injury as well. So uh, you, you got to remember the decathlon is rough. It is not easy. It's rough. It's really hard on the body. Yeah. There's ten events. They're all incredibly difficult events to do. So you know, and and Warner 
like this, like his 100 meter time is world class. Yeah. Like he could compete in the 100 individually. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, no, no, he, he throws some, uh, he throws uh, some stuff out there. Um, and you yeah, know, Tam right. Tamara Tebow. Yes, we should get women's hammer throw too. Yeah. Tamara Tebow, the boxer who was, uh, scheduled, uh, like a lot of people thought she would win gold knocked out in the first round. Shady Elnahas was mm -hmm. a metal co uh, prospect knocked out in the first round. Team judo knocked out in the first round. Um, you know, so there was a lot of people that were considered locks. Mm -hmm. So that means there's a lot of Canadians that stepped up like that fencer, Eleanor Harvey, right? Yes. So, so that's the beauty of the Olympics. Well, and there's always these surprise stories that come out of nowhere. I mean, come on, nobody, Penny Alexiak in, in Rio in 2016 won a Nobody saw that coming. No one saw that coming. They, they just had her there to get her experience. She won a gold medal. <laughs> yep. Hello. That's what I mean. Yep. Nobody saw that coming. So, um, like I said, our athletes, they're rocking it. Yeah. They're so rocking it. Okay. Um, but, uh, so far it's looking pretty good to hit, uh, hit the 20 oh, and yeah. then some so, that was predicted. So a, right. a sub above power performance from our athletes really doing us proud. So if you could take a moment, uh, to just like wear some red and white to cheer or, you know, send them a nice message mm -hmm. on social media or whatnot, like us, we're proud of you, win or lose, or all that kind of stuff. You know, let's do some good. So, uh, that way let's, uh, let's cheer for our own. They're wonderful ambassadors for us. And that's what I will say. I won't touch on the other stuff for democracy. Just do that today. Just do that. Just do that today. All right. From the Beaver Lodge, it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. And uh, don't let the bot farms get you down. They're not real. They're not real. Twitter is not real life. No, it's not. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Yeah, we're going to continue. Uh, I don't know if they're words of wisdom, but we are going to continue to name and shame and expose those who do terrible things like Michelle Rumpelgarner did. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that on this show because we want you to know what these people who represent you that we pay are doing. And what they say about you behind your back. We need you to know this so you can make an informed decision at the ballot box. And, and don't just think we're picking on the cons. It's not that. Mm. It's just they're the ones who are doing the horrible things the most. The most often. We call out Jug Meat when he does stuff. We call out liberals the other day. We will call out anybody who does something bad every single time. That's never going to let up. I don't care what your political stripe is. You do something that is harmful to people to vulnerable people, to Canadians, to the country. We're going to name and shame you every single time. One standard for all. That's Not right. on a sliding scale. No, it's the same standard for everyone. You do something bad, we're going to talk about it. You treat people that you're supposed to represent with disdain and contempt or we're disrespect. Talk about it. Sorry, because I had a discussion with someone who's a, a, a friend Mm -hmm. Of Anita Vandenbelt. It's like, Anita did nothing wrong. No, 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 no. Like, this one's like, yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. She didn't start it. She didn't set up the meeting, whatnot. Was, but she proposed that the meeting be some, about something else. Mm -hmm. They didn't take, they chose to discuss a process argument instead of having the meeting on a particular sensitive subject. And she refused to apologize unreservedly. There are things objectively she could have done better. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you're really partisan, are you? Really? Because you're the one that's saying that she did nothing wrong. And I'm saying nobody put the survivors first. Everybody could have done something better. I think objectively that makes you the partisan, the strident partisan. Mm -hmm. If you can't recognize now, it says, Hey, listen, I understand she's your friend. So you're not objective, but that didn't matter. Because I wasn't willing to put 100% of the blame on the three conservative mean girls. No. There's just, blame to be because spread there around. Was for different reasons and different things, but there was blame mm -hmm. to go around. Mm -hmm. I was the partisan. No, clearly you are. If you can't recognize that she could have done one thing better, mm -hmm. now she handled her. Conservatives handed out bait. She bit. And we're not asking for perfection. We don't expect it. Just try harder. Just realize when you've done something wrong, own up to it, and then commit to doing better. Like a normal human. It's not that don't difficult. Don't be weird. It's not that difficult. It really isn't. 
All right. All right, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. So, I'm going to revisit something we discussed earlier. Ooh, please do. Uh, and I want to, I want to, I want to put this out there that I think when they hired the bot farm for Polyev, they got a free bowl of soup with it. Uh, I don't know if they went to Fiverr for this bot farm, but holy crap! You got to see this. Okay, this is from Heather Moen Co. There are, as the thread below says, hundreds of these fake fakes claiming to have attended Polyev's rally. There's more than Apple evidence that never Polyev and his backers use inauthentic online manipulation. Are these foreign-backed ops? Sure looks that way. So there's, there's a couple of things here, right? We see this and we went through those four, but let's take a look at this one. There are some odd slip-ups that reveal this is not a domestic bot farm, but just software. So who had these bots programmed is the question. The locations accidentally alluded to are not typical. This one is in Latvia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Gava. Then there's this one. It took its avatar from a very strange Indonesian, Inst- in- Indonesian Instagram account. Its location says Hawaii, but has wedding packages available from Garut, Indonesia. Wedding packages. Wow. And this one is all over the place. Its handle claims UK, then in Portuguese, says it covers story in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, while claiming to be in New Jersey, but somehow attending a Polyev rally in a small northern Ontario town. I've seen that one specifically. Yeah. Bots using the same phrase. Just returned from Pierre Polyev's rally in Kirkland Lake, and I'm still buzzing from the energy. Are still at it today. This is from 45 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And I tried to like look at one of those big lists and get the names out because I figured, hey, what a great way to pre-block. A lot of them have already disappeared. You can't find the accounts, but they were just for that, and then they're gone. But the tweet stays up. And a great number of them you have to look at have nine followers. Yep. One follower. Yep. Join July 2024. Yep. New account. Join July 2024. New accounts, no followers. No, yeah. Low to no accounts. Just joined this month. It's a bot farm, and it's not a very good one. They're really bad at this, aren't they? Yes. And it's just like, what me- again, what message are you supposed to get by the fact that you have to manufacture so his support is not real. Clearly. So, yeah. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention before we go, um, because I forgot to mention it when it happened, but August 1st, Emancipation Day. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's right. Um, we did. Because, we blanked out, didn't we? Yes, we did completely blank out. And uh, to all the kids who uh, saw the National Association with Black Journalists interview with uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> I still haven't figured out yet what it is I turned black, but I'm thinking about it. So Let me know when you figure it out, huh? Um, I, I appreciate yeah. that. Just, it might have been so that I'm in time, on the loop. It might have been at that time I was in a luggage store in Toronto and um, some people were following me. Mm, that must have been the That time. might have been the day I turned yeah, black. Probably. Not sure yet, but let me think about that. Okay, get back to me. I'd like to know. <laughs> Can I do that too? Can I do that? Probably not. I, <laughs> you have my permission. Tell okay. me when you turned black, Mr. <laughs> I will do that. All righty. I'll see you later.